the first hybrid Scotland's community heritage conversation. Um, I do want to say as well, today we're going to be joined by Just Sign, BSL interpreters, Nicole and Ruth. And you can see there that they are spotlit um, up at the top. So if you are speaking today, whether it is on Teams or whether in, you're in the room, please just be mindful, speaking clearly, tone, pitch, etc. And that will make it as easy as possible um, for our colleagues from Just Sign. Um, today, the audio and the acoustics in this room, um, the way the room is designed, you don't need microphones and such like. So just kind of trust in that process that speaking at your normal volume is absolutely fine. So my name is Rosie Wiley. I'm the National Volunteering and Community Development Manager with Historic Environment Scotland, uh, Scotland and part of this committee that has brought you today's event. Now, one of the um, silver linings of a very challenging few years for us all is this jump forward in digital inclusivity. And as I say, we're joined from all around the country and um, from colleagues on Teams. Now, this is the first fully hybrid event for this committee, whether we're in the room today or whether we're in the Teams call. So please be patient and be kind, just if there is a few little techie challenges or anything like that. Um, we are joined um, by Sandy, one of our photographers today. Um, there are signs up at the entrance, but again, if you don't want to um, feature any of those, please just um, let yourself be known to Sante um, and he will be conscious of that. So we're going to try um, a little thing here called together mode. There's a lot of people here on the Teams call as well, 40 people, um, and we just want everybody to just say hello to each other um, and you can see who is all joining us from around the country. So as I forewarned you on Teams, we're going to switch on together mode. So if you don't want to give a wave, then please turn off your camera. Go for it, Rosie. We haven't tried this before, so we're hoping this is going to work. OK, there we go. <laughs> so give us a wave, everybody from Teams. OK, so you can see um, that there is much more of us than just here in the room, and we do want to try and be inclusive as that. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> lovely, lovely to meet you all. OK, great. Um, so we just need to turn off the recording started box as well at the top. OK. Fantastic. OK, so can I do out my pre-flight checks? All important. I want to say Historic Environment Scotland, Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, Archaeology Scotland and the Scottish Council on Archives have all brought you today's event. But that is not the start of this journey. Um, we have brought 11 conversations to you during the lockdowns and now here we are in person. But the journey for this began as part of the Community Heritage Conferences and we've got colleagues in the room today such as Eve and Cara joining us online who have been part of this conference for a very long time. This was just a digital reimagining when the lockdowns hit of those original conferences. And I think that there is some people in this room and on teams that have been part of those conferences for many room, uh, many years. So it's wonderful to all be back together in person. Important housekeeping. Um, if you're on teams, please keep your cameras off if it will help with your um, internet connectivity and streaming. And it also just helps with prioritisation there for the BSL interpreters and um, been able to see the people that are speaking. If you're in the auditorium, please have uh, phones on silent. And as I say, be mindful of talking amongst yourselves because you will get picked up and heard. Um, if you're on Teams, please feel free to use your reaction buttons. And um, you can see Joanna there has got her hands up. You'll see the reactions button um, at the top of your screen if you need it. And Joanna's going to be putting information in the chat there. So. As I said, just be mindful of acoustics and being picked up if you're in the room today. We're not anticipating any fire tests today, um, so if the alarm does sound, please just leave the building immediately near your um, fire exit and we will be the marshals that will um, accompany you out the building. In terms of the toilets, hopefully you found them, but when you came in to the main entrance, they were on your left hand side. Visitor Wi-Fi is available throughout the engine shed. There's no password, there's no charge. And you'll just find that um, as guest Wi-Fi and you can log straight in. Please don't bring teas and coffees in here unless you've got a lid on. Very important information. And now for the more important news is about food and lunch. So we are, of course, um, catering for you at both main breaks and lunch. There'll be a buffet lunch um, provided, vegetarian and um, vegan and um, catering for other specific dietary needs. Please take as much as you want. Um, we did have some transitions um, from in-person 
to teams at the last minute, so there is a lot of sandwiches to go around. <laughs> so please do enjoy them. Um, if you haven't already signed up for a workshop this morning, you'll see the sign up sheets um, that are in there with a big arrow pointing down at them. You can't miss them. If you can do that at the break time, that would be wonderful. And also Joanna will be sharing information to anybody that is on the Teams call about your online things. So one of the great things about today is that the content has been completely curated by yourselves. As a committee, we did not put anybody on this programme today ourselves. We did a big call out, we wrote out to people. So everybody that is speaking or is putting on a workshop today has volunteered themselves as that call out about exploring the topic of resilience for community heritage, for the wider sector and the potentials that's coming out for collaboration and working together. So as I say, everybody that's here today, they put themselves forward to do it. And we're really excited to hear kind of what people's thoughts are and the conversation as it progresses. Um, there's going to be a panel later on, so there'll be Q and A's at the end of each speaking session, but also you can save questions for that panel. Completely up to you, but please don't stay quiet. Say what you want. That's what these conversations are all about. And um, at the end of the day, you'll be able to talk um, to some experts for kind of um, dropping informal um, surgeries, if you like, and there's information about them on the programme. So a wee bit of a Slido warm up. So. You'll have seen here there is a QR code for a Slido and there is a QR code also for the all important agenda. So if you've got your smartphone, if you get your smartphone out um, and you scan this big QR code here. I'm going to do it as well. So basically um, Slido is a tech that helps bring us all together. So you just go into your photo, your camera settings and it will bring it up. And then you click on it. Go. Open it up. This is actually quite hard to do whilst holding an iPad as well. OK, great. So is everybody into Slido? Raise your hand if you are. Oh, yeah, that cool house. Brilliant. OK, then. So you can type a question. Yep, so we can bring up the next one. Here we go. OK, so. The first question is as on your um, badges that hopefully people have written here that are in the room. So anyone joining us on the Teams call, we ask people when they arrive to just pop to me heritages on their name badges. So is everybody there? Um, thumbs up, please, from Teams as well. If you've got your Slido's live. I think everybody's concentrating on that. OK, everyone's concentrating. We'll go with that. Oh, yes, look, there we go. There's all the thumbs up there. OK, so pop into you what your heritage is. Essential, expensive, newish, the furniture, inspiring, sustainable history, community. So, oh, I love this. <laughs> Inclusive, essential to life. I love that one. Whoever put that to be shared everything. That's what I was thinking as well. Whoever put that it is. It's everything all around us. Sustainable, continually fascinating. OK. So we are going to keep going, keep going. Look at this. I'm going to come in. Four participants typing. Sorry, I get a bit overexcited with Slido. Um, I'm not going to lie. This will be a theme throughout the day. So when this word cloud is generated, we are going to share this. Those uh, those notifications will go off. By the way, we just don't want to turn those off right now. Well, oh, three participants typing. We're still going. OK, we'll just give it another couple of seconds. OK, so you can see here how Slido is functioning, and this is just a bit of a warm up for us, basically. But we're going to use Slido throughout the whole day. We are going to go. Oh, there's more people. I really don't want to stop. <laughs> oh. OK, yep. OK, so if you go on to the next one. OK, then. So what is your power animal? You've not got a phone out. Do you want me to put your power animal in the What's your email? What do you think? I'll put mine in. Right, I am a unicorn. Yes. Don't think the panther and the unicorn want to meet each other and they go, oh, it's just like a Julia Donaldson novel. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel like we need a, we've got any storytellers in the room. I feel like we could sort of bring this all together quite nicely. OK, so this is a, a bit of fun and um, you can see how it works. Slido is for you today. So um, throughout the whole day, 
you will see on the left hand, top left hand of your Slido's Q and A's as well. OK, so as the day progresses, you type in a question and that will get collated into the brain of Slido. And that's a way of you being able to um, pose a question to the speakers as they're talking, basically. Um, but the main reason is so that everybody on Teams and everybody in the room has the same opportunity to put the questions in. OK, um, and then when it comes to the Q&A, I'll read them out. What time is lunch? 12.30. Very important. Yeah, <laughs> I should have made you cover that already. Thank you very much. Um, so we will read them out directly, but obviously ask your questions live. It's not all about digital today as well. Um, you don't have to use Slido, of course, goes without saying. And it's the same in the Teams call. When we start the Q&A, we'll ask, first of all, does anyone in the room or anyone in the Teams room have any question? But Slido really is just a little bit of fun. OK, so today really is about your conversations. OK, this committee is just here to facilitate them. So sit back, enjoy hearing from like minded people. Um, and as I say, please don't keep quiet and um, say whatever is on your mind. And um, that is what we are looking for. So we have got our first presenters coming up now. OK, and that is um, Dom and uh, Signe, Stina. Signe, I'm really sorry, I was practicing that and I wasn't sure if I was going to get it right, um, from um, Our Story Scotland. Um, Dom is Chair of Our Story Scotland and a keen community mapper, and Signe is Treasurer of Our Story Scotland and um, Museum Studies postgrad at Aberde Aberdeen University. Now, Dom was going to be here today, but actually tested positive for COVID last night, but it's here in the Teams room. Hurrah! So still here um, as we go. So are you up first? Yeah, lovely. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, like Rosa said, we are our story Scotland and we collect, archive and present the life stories of LGBTQ plus people in Scotland. And we primarily do this through doing oral history interviews. And what we're going to talk about today is how that uh, doing oral history interviews um, adds to mental and emotional resilience and well-being in both the interviewee and the interviewer. So I will talk about the interviewees first and then I will afterwards take it over to Dom for the interviewer. Uh, so if I could have the next slide, please. So I'll take you through some examples. So first, I'd like to play this clip for you from Nick. Um, Oh, I need to have my blend on. It's all watching me. All right. Oh, and I should also say this is this clip is from uh, earlier in Nick is telling about how in his earlier life he identified as a lesbian. So this clip is about his sister finding out and him finding out that his sister knows. Oh, I'm sorry, we tested it this morning and it was absolutely fine. Sorry. Be two minutes of that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, let's try it again. Why? You hit the show your screen. Did I hit the same button again? 17, I was still at home and when I'd met her, also, and I started writing about it in a diary. You had that and I used to keep it under like my mattress in my bed. And my sister, I used to share a room with my sister, but uh, she found it. She obviously went looking for something, <laughs> you know, there's no way you get <laughs> She was up because she was wondering what I was doing as well, because I'd always been really close to my sister. And although I never talked to her about these kind of things, because I thought 
you know, we just didn't talk about those kind of things. Um, it was like she knew that there was something going on, and I think she was just scared that she was missing out on something, really, that there was something going on that I was involved in that she didn't know about. Um, so she found it and read it. Uh, and she didn't tell me that she'd read it until weeks later, but she, she told her best friend as well, so the, her best friend Louise. Um, so the, both of them knew about it, and they'd been talking about it for weeks before they let me know that they knew. Um, How did they let you know? Well, we were all, there was one night we were all sitting, my sister and Louise were getting ready to go out just to uh, some, I can't remember where they were going, some kind of night club or something like that, or not a proper night club, like some disco thing or something. Uh, and we were drinking, obviously, we were too young to drink, but we did drink and stuff as well. So we were all sitting drinking, we had a bottle of vodka between the three of us. And uh, that's, that's when they told me, you know. So the, there came this, actually that happened over a period of months, I just remembered that actually, where um, we didn't talk anything through the week at all. And on maybe a Friday or Saturday night, we'd sit and share a bottle of vodka together, me and Alison and Louise, and talk about everything. And the next day, not mention it again. It was, it was almost like there was so many things that were not allowed to be talked about and they were quite sort of taboo and they were just, you just didn't talk about these kind of things. And we didn't, apart from with this bottle of vodka, it was like, that bottle of vodka was kind of just let us talk about these things at that time. Wow, I just remembered that actually, that's quite strange. I'd kind of forgotten about that, that period. So in this, in this moment, Nick is uncovering memories and he has this joy in rediscovering uh, a part of his history. And that gives him, you know, this confidence in himself and, his, and in his bonds to his sister. He realizes actually him and his sister had these conversations before. Um, and then I would like to uh, show you a clip from Margaret. On the next 17, I was still at home when I'd met Alison. I started writing. <laughs> yeah, Margaret, uh, afterwards, I'll be asking you to fill in one of these permission forms, right? Okay, and um, perhaps that's something which for you would, would be quite new. Well, I would say that um, 20 years ago, I would never have found myself in this position and no way would have signed any form uh, with names or addresses relating to my sexuality. So this, is a, I've came a long way in 20 years, although 20 years is a long time. <laughs> but it's still, changed a lot. Uh -huh, and I feel it is important for me to maybe put this down on, on record. Well, it's, it's very important for us too. Mm. So. Um, can you tell us something about your background and, and your age now is? Uh, 58. Right. Uh, 58. I was born in Glasgow uh, in a uh, tenement and not far from the city centre. Uh, working class parents um, and uh, um, no further education, just left school at 16 and um, basically, I don't know what else to say for <laughs> uh, Is it a large family? No, there's only myself and my brother and uh, well, I, looking back now, I mean, uh, my family life, uh, if I think about it, um, my mother put up with quite a lot because my father was alcoholic and uh, it was part and parcel for me to listen to all types of abuse at the weekends. In this, uh, this is the very beginning of Margaret's interview. We can see that she feels that this is either still is risky or at least has been risky for her to talk about. So she is overcoming a previous fear in telling her story uh, through this interview. And that gives her this confidence of, of overcoming a fear. And then she starts out very unsure, a lot of pauses, a lot of uh, unsure of what has worked. And then the interviewer guides her by saying, you know, what about your family? And then 
she gains this confidence in telling her story. And there is very little hesitation after this point when she realizes actually a lot of this has worth. My whole story has worth. So then she just kind of goes on from there where she starts very uh, sort of unsure. Uh, and then finally, I would like to share a clip from Chris. Margaret, uh, off. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Uh, I just want to say before we start is, I know this may be difficult and painful for me, but I think it's really, I think it's really important for two of the reasons. One, I think it's incredibly important we get our stories down because we're of the age we went through difficult times and those times are going to be forgotten and we're of an age so we're of the age that soon the story's going to be forgotten and i think it's so important to get them down uh, because 20 30 years ago and further things were so different but also for me i think it's really cathartic because a lot a lot of these issues I've realised have just been stuck there for 40 years. Um, and it amazes me that nearly 40 years ago, 40 years since, um, um, that the whole situation stuck in bringing up emotion and tears. So he talks about how it's his story has been stuck inside of him for 40 years um and he also talks about this catharsis that he's looking for in this and he actually wrote to us after the interview if i could get the next slide please um he wrote to us the story had been inside me for 40 years next year so that was last year 2022 and the tears shed were always into an empty void I finally had ears that would listen to my experience, my story, and those tears were no longer into that void, but were heard. And now my story has been recorded for posterity. So he he had the story that was stuck inside of him and he finally got to tell them and his tears no longer felt like they were they were unheard. He felt heard, understood, and he uh, is, is relieved um, that now his story will be shared. Um, so that was uh, uh, some insight into how interviewees can feel in this process. And now I would like to take it over to Don to talk about interviewers. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to stick with Chris for a minute because like he talked about finding those ears, he finally had those ears and had that catharsis was unstuck. So that in itself can be a really to have it being part of that can be feel great, simply feel amazing. Can I get the next slide, please, Rosie? Um, and this is from an interviewer, the interviewer that did Chris's interview. Um, it's always a privilege and a revelation to listen to the life stories of our community. Engaging with a life story, you cannot remain impassive. You may be moved to laughter or tears silently. Of course, this is in the context of an oral history interview, but it is a privilege. You feel real honour that people have chosen you to share their story with, especially when it's a story like Chrissy's. And you cannot remain impassive at all. When you two meet, you are different when you leave. You've both made such intimate contact through this interview that when you go, both go your separate ways, you cannot be unchanged. Can I get the next slide, please? Another interviewer. Preparing and reading aloud extracts from stories that people have had the courage and willingness to share with our story Scotland has had a really powerful emotional impact on me. The privilege of having access to vividly and candidly told stories gave me a whole new, broader, deeper understanding of and appreciation for the diversity of follow, fellow LGBTQ plus people in Scotland's lived experience of everyday joys, fears, challenges and triumphs. This volunteer got to choose stories and had that real, had their own identity reaffirmed. It sometimes puts you in a position to question your own identity, but after that questioning, you are definitely reaffirmed. Having that new understanding and appreciation of your own community, it changes from an abstract thing 
to a real feeling, a real connectedness. Um, next slide, please, Ruby. Reading aloud extracts from real lived experience and an event fostered environments where LGBTQ plus participants feel safe, comfortable and unable to share their own lived experiences. While non LGBTQ plus participants have felt unable to take the opportunity of questioning their knowledge and understanding of LGBTQ plus people's lives, perhaps for the first time. So this isn't just for us, this is for non LGBT people as well. This isn't just tokenism, this is a place, a safe place to question through narratives to get access to our heritage, sometimes for the first time. And that can also reaffirm people's identities and being in the position to share, it's lovely, just feels so nice to create that space for other people through sharing stories. Next slide, please. I have interviewed several people about being in Shibu. Each time I have been surprised to find how strongly people feel about being part of Shibu and the importance to them of belonging to a band on so many levels. Social, political, mental well-being. I share many of these feelings. Doing the interviews and listening to the recordings has brought me closer to the people I interviewed. I has also been able to share some clips from the recordings with the wider membership of the band. And it's been great to see everyone's responses to the memories and thoughts of the interviewees. That surprise, that that shock at having this, these shared feelings, this, this new perspective and a new perspective is really important because it's shared. You've got that opportunity to have a shared perspective and that reaffirms you, it makes you feel more connected. The, the interviewer who's listening at home, um, being part of that band is obviously important, but she's learned how the different, again, it's not as abstract, it's much more fuller and whole and being able to share them and see this responses. Again, it's a lovely thing to be in a, a privileged opportunity to do. Next slide, please. It has also felt like a sense of community and confidence is built in the act of sharing stories. It is a privilege and a profound responsibility to create temporary spaces where people want to share a story from their lives and feel safe to share the emotions connected or provoked by the retelling of their stories. We speak a lot about this, about that sense of community and confidence is built when you can, like Sina said, overcome that fear, talk about something that you have been told all your life to be keep quiet, to not discuss that nobody wants to hear. And then to find yourself in a place that not just your story being shared, but people are reciprocating their own stories and response. And you get that lovely cycle of, of community building and coming closer. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Right, that's the end. I wanted to go right back to Chris as well and talk about his, his like, he wanted catharsis. He said he was stuck and because we provided the ears, he could become unstuck. And part of his email and response was about getting in touch with organisations like Fighting With Pride. And for an, us to have a very small, small, small part and him being able to have an active serving officer who is LGBTQ to call him a brother when he had such a traumatic experience and uh, the Ministry of Defence. And for us as, a, as all volunteers to have a tiny wee part in him becoming unstuck, I do not have the words to express how that makes me feel. It makes me feel lovely. It makes me feel like I am really doing good, 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 good. Not just archival work, but community work. It's lovely stuff. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Oh, questions. Brilliant. Um, so thank you so much uh, both for that presentation. Now, questions before we go to Slido, where there's a few questions coming in. I want to go to the Teams room. Oh, round of applause there coming through Teams. I'd like to just go to the Teams room first. Does anybody have any questions from the Teams call that you would like to um, unmute and ask directly? Any hands going up? Any Martin? Martin's Martin, our Martin. roving reporter. Oh. No hands. No hands. No hands. Oh. A little bit of echo there. It's fine. 
OK, so any questions coming through live here? Anyone want to raise their hand and ask a question? Yep. Um, can you hear me from the seat? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks very much for that um, presentation. And clearly it's an important process, both for those who are speaking and those who are listening. And um, I was really interested. Uh, it's not so much a question, but I work at the um, in heritage at the former Crichton Royal Asylum and have recorded um, some former patients who had very traumatic experiences related to their gender identity in the 1970s. And I'd quite like to ask, ask you, uh, not today, but to maybe make some contact to talk about um, uh, working in ethical and sensitive ways that allow people to um, share stories that are so important. I would love that, and I think that's a real big like we like Lucina said we archive we collect archive and present so present and comes with those ethical challenges and I'm so glad to hear that you get that you really understand that and are thinking about that. You can have my email address. It was on the screen a second ago. Jom at ourstoryscotland.org.uk. I'll be love to make contact with you. Love to. Thanks very much. We can give you that email and follow up. Just come and find us. OK, any more questions from the room? OK, so um, coming through from Slido, what is She Boom? Oh, uh, that's a group, a band that one of our uh, interviewers is part of. Uh, it's all drummers, women mm -hmm. drummers. It's a yes. women that's drummers a group. Time. You'll often see them leading prides. You can't miss them. They're very, very loud. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, so next question there, how do you risk assess about disclosing trauma in oral histories? Is it aftercare for interviewers and interviewees? There is, we do ask people, We and part of our um, copyright is a double signature before and after because people might disclose things that they're not prepared for, like spur of the moment, have regrets, might not want things in there. Luckily enough, I am a trained trauma counsellor. That's just an extra. Um, so we do have things in place where we can come together, that we can, we have meetings, we all risk assess ourselves really ongoingly. And it's not just when you're doing oral histories, we also summarise those interviews. So summarisers are also could possibly be exposed to people discussing traumatic events. Um, LGBTQ plus history is incredibly traumatic. So there's always a trigger warning when you see LGBT history, you know it's going to be traumatic. We have all the joy, but we have the trauma as well. All our stories are about resilience because if people have got to a point that they can tell that story to us, then that's a really powerful move. That's an incredibly privileged position to have that recorded for us in our community. Um, that is also ongoing. Um, if we are talking about ordering interviews and how to label them so um, summarisers can kind of grade if they're OK with that, um, there's always aftercare in place and uh, always, um, if it's not through me, we can get in touch with another sort of um, support agency. It's part of the job. It's part of it. OK, thank you. Okay. Um, so I just conscious of um, time here because there's lots of questions coming through for you. So, so sort of some quick fire ones. Can you volunteer with your project? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're a remote group, so uh, we are all the, we're based online. So anywhere in Scotland you are, if you are like Isle of Skye, if you're uh, in the borderlands, anywhere. Um, OK. Yeah. Great. And to the website to find out more information, yeah, I assume. Website, yeah, website, um, email, my email. OK. Um, training and resources. What training resources do you provide for interviewers? Well, a big part of that is the experience of being interviewed. If you want to become an interviewer, you have to know what it's like to be on the other side of that. So first off, we do an oral history interview and it can be limited. It can be more themed for um, new volunteers. Um, and it, we do do like training days and go through that. We have many of our volunteers are incredibly skilled people who have PhDs, masters. Um, so we all come together and skill share. Um, it's a constant, again, reviewing that process, reviewing 
how good our practice is. It's a constant reflective practice that we all take part in. OK, great. Thank you very much. So um, there are some more questions on the Slido, but you'll be here all day. So please do have chat, networking breaks, etc. Dom, are you heading off back to your bed now? Um, possibly. Um, can I <laughs> reply to questions on Slido? Well, that's what we were just checking up. It looks like uh, no is the answer to that in terms of replying directly to them because they've um, some have come through anonymous and such like. Right. So if you're hanging out in the Teams call for a wee bit, maybe there's some people that might want to have um, a chat with you in the chat. But if not, um, you've got email addresses there so you can have some yep. follow ups. Yeah, yep. great. I'll be here okay. for a wee bit though. Thank you for listening, everybody. It's great that you've all come together for this. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I'll be here all day, so just come up Great. to me. OK, I'd give a round of applause myself, but I can't. Thank you so much. Wonderful. OK, so next up, um, we're hearing about COAST, a project by and for our coastal communities. So we are joined by Camille um, Dressler, a chair of Small Isles Community Council and vice chair of the European Small Islands Federation. Her interests are community empowerment and community energy, as well as heritage and the arts. A Gaelic learner, she has established a crofting museum and bilingual crofting trail on the Isle of Egg and is a founder member of Common Eich Tree Eich. Is that correct? Wonderful. Um, Camille was the coast story gatherer for the small isles and the road to the isles, as well as creating many of the other stories gathered from throughout the West Coast. We are also joined um, by um, Dr Katie Murray, who is coming in from Teams, is a project officer on the Coast Project. She works for UHI North, West and Hebrides on a range of projects centred around heritage interpretation and sustainable tourism development. So. Uh, is it Camille or Katie going first? It's Katie. OK, wonderful. Off Over to you, Katie. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and hello, everybody, both online and in person. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly this morning just to kind of give an overview of the Coast Project and sort of contextualise the work that Camille did before she does the bulk of, of this presentation. Um, I'm part of a team at UHI that worked on this project and we are part of a much, much wider team that also included tourism consultants, web developers, design consultants and a big team of story gatherers that you'll be hearing much more about that kind of worked on this project and brought these stories to life. Um, the Coast project is, combines heritage and tourism. The overall purpose was to use West Coast cultural heritage to use stories to encourage visitors, to encourage people to travel to less well visited places, as well as helping locals learn more about their own areas. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? It began in 2020. And um, the first stage was to gather a lot of stories, to gather a lot of this content. And we had several methods of doing this. We had an online survey. We had a series of online digital workshops. This was, of course, taking place in the context of COVID. So we probably had more online activity than we originally planned. Um, but our most sort of novel and important and possibly a bit experimental story gathering method was the use of what we were calling local agents. If I could get the next slide, please. So we divvied up our area, effectively the west coast, mainland and islands of Scotland and appointed a local story gatherer for each area. Uh, this was a paid position. The gatherers were tasked with working with both heritage institutions and individuals within their community to unearth stories that might be used for this project, including ones we thought this was quite important that might not have been published elsewhere that we were calling hidden gems. And the idea of this was that these were the people embedded within their communities that would know who to talk to, that would know where to go in order to unearth these stories. Can I get the next slide, please? Um, at the end of this process, 
Uh, the team at UHI, we had received about 1,300 contributions, potential stories using all these methods. This rather messy spreadsheet that I'm showing you, it was part of our curation process where we took the stories, we decided which ones we were going to use. We used about 350 of them in the end, making sure we had a good geographical spread, making sure we were addressing a lot of different themes and went about curating them for presentation on the website and app that I'm about to show you. So I'm sure lots of people in the room will be familiar with this kind of work. It was about doing additional research. It was about getting permissions. It was about sourcing images where we didn't already have an image. We actually worked extensively with some of the story gatherers again during this process, which wasn't something that had been written into the original project, but we found that actually going back and using their local knowledge again uh, during this stage was absolutely crucial. And Camille, as you'll hear, got very, very involved with this stage of the project as well. Uh, I don't think we would have succeeded without her, actually. Uh, next slide, I'm just going to run through a couple of outputs of the project or what we actually used the stories for. Um, we developed an app. This has all the stories listed on there. They're sorted by theme, they're sorted by subject. They're presented on a interactive map where we mapped, we geolocated each story to an appropriate location. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's just to show you how the stories were presented and each little marker on the map there represents a different story. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, we sorted them by sort of subject matter to make it as easy as possible for people to find the stories that they were most interested in. Of course, the purpose of the map was the hope that people would use the map to actually visit the sites where stories took place. And we tried to focus on areas and sites that weren't very well visited, bringing in the tourism element of the whole project. Next slide, please. Uh, we also created an app, which also included all the stories, also included the map, and which also included a selection of audio stories. We had some of them recorded by professional storytellers. Next slide, please. And finally, we also used the stories to create a series of four travelling exhibitions that travelled through kind of community spaces, heritage spaces and ferry terminals appropriately on the west coast of Scotland throughout the summer last year. Uh, next slide, please. At the moment, we're in the process of dismantling these exhibitions and sending the stories back to their host communities, you might say. So trying to return the stories home in a sense. So we've sent them to Skye, to Ely, to Lewis, to Canna. Um, so there will now be a series of very mini coast exhibitions um, throughout the West Coast and Islands. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just our social channels. We kept up a social media campaign throughout the whole project and we're still maintaining it quite intermittently nowadays, now that the project has formally come to an end. And the final slide, the next slide that I'm going to present, just shows our funders and everybody who was involved. And now I'm handing over to Camille, who is there with you in person today. Hi, everyone. So as you can see, it was a, a very, very complex project and um, it took quite a, a long time to do the gathering. My task was to gather the stories from the small isles, because that's where I lived and I've lived for 40 years, and uh, the road to the isles and Noidart. So that was a bit of a tall order because I live in the small isles, I don't live in the road to the isles, but I have contact throughout my my long life in the, in, in the West, in the, in the Hebrides. So I thought it was going to be um, quite easy, but in fact, it was actually quite complicated because it was a question of finding the people that were willing to talk to me about things. And COVID obviously was in the middle of all that. So that was a bit of an issue. However, 
what was really good, and I'd like to um, get the first slide. So here we are. Uh, that's my home in Ireland. So I live on the Isle of Egg, which is the most populated. And you have Canna, Rum and Muck. And all these communities are changing rapidly with a lot of newcomers to these communities. And I felt that it was really important to unearth both the past and also tell the stories of the people that have been important in the life of these islands. And um, perhaps the second slide. Because it was developing, it was helping to develop also a sense of uh, community to bring back the stories of these people that were important to the community. And um, I'm really pleased that the, the wee doctor in the kilt, um, Dr. Hector McLean, who was the longest serving GP in the Small Isles, was part of the curated uh, stories. And um, just wanted to tell you a little bit more about him, for instance, because he, he came to the Small Isles after work, um, uh, after, after serving in, in, in the North African campaign and being decorated and in the Normandy landing. And he was my doctor. And when I went for my um, um, pregnancy check, he would offer me a cup of tea afterwards and he would start telling me about the Normandy landing and his part in it because he knew that I had um, lived in Normandy. So I just wish I'd recorded him then. But I wanted to pay homage to his um, importance in the island because, you know, he, he did serve for 39 years, only retiring in 1990 after he was sure of getting a replacement based on egg and not on the mainland as it was then threatened. Better an old doctor than a no doctor. This is frontier medicine. Um, the medical equivalent of the Falklands, you would say, uh, famously. And two months after his retirement, he actually delivered the last baby to be born on egg and emergency arrival two weeks before his due date. Um, he was always wearing a kilt and he was famous for going to the other islands in a canoe when he could, the Isle of Muck, maybe not Rum or Canna. And I recorded Lawrence, Lawrence's memory of seeing Dr. McLean uh, when he was 12 year old. And I just heard from his son that visited not long ago that when Dr. McLean started, there was no phone on the island. And if there was an emergency on Muck, they would simply make a fire with a big black smoke and that would be seen on egg and then the doctor would go. <laughs> so these kind of stories, you know, that's so priceless. It's really important to, to capture because people don't realize what kind of uh, medical services we had in, in the old days. The other person I wanted to record also was uh, um, Lawrence, the, the Laird of Mark has just passed away. And I don't know if anybody, uh, any of you has seen the Prince of Mark that was uh, a film made about his life that was shown on BBC. I still believe it's on BBC and you can catch up. But Lawrence was an amazing person, quite a charismatic character. And it was due to his vision of um, and his strength of belief that the island should be uh, have a continuous population and the struggle to bring in and maintain a small population on the end of Mark. He was quite a legendary in his a legend in his own right because he was very much larger than life. It was described as a thick set writing of a man and was once seen struggling to get a very large pony on board a very small boat at Glenwood Pier. All lookers were particularly amazed at the size of, size of his hands. In the end, Lawrence just tucked his shoulder right behind the full moose backside and hiked the surprise animal straight on board. <laughs> so Lawrence McKeown struggled to overcome and, um, and refusal to be beaten by the logistics of life of movement has become legendary over the years. And one of the stories that I was wanting to share with the course people was the story of purchasing Pathfinder, a bull from, prize bull from Lynn. Okay, so uh, the bull arrived from the open sales to Malik in a lorry, and the plan was to put it in a horse box and load the box on the mud boots. Didn't work like, like this. Pathfinder went straight in and out through the front door of the horse box, took off and shoved down the pier, making for the sea. Then he turned back, sped through Malik towards the railway line and headed off towards Fort William. Lawrence finally caught up with him in Mora, and when the bull saw him, he went back towards Malik. A bit tired by that time, so it was easier to somehow get him back on the road to park, and finally onto the mud boats. Sailing over to Mark on the full moon, it took another hour to be between the farm because he kept sort of lying down, he was so tired. So stories like that was just uh, really important for us to sort of like um, uh, 
were curated because it was important to to show the side of these colorful characters. And one of the things that was really important also is the fact that Lawrence, um, when he was growing up on Mutt, was in contact with the last Gaelic speakers on the island. So he actually had memory of all the Gaelic place names, which is now without him, these would have been lost. So I also recorded him doing that. And also his sister, with whom he had the fight on who knew the best stories about Mutt, had never uh, shared her knowledge of Mutt. She lives on Lismore. And she was able to give us loads of little gem of stories about life on Mutt, about traditions of Mutt, that even Lawrence didn't know. So there always been a bit of a fight. I know better. No, I know better. It's all wrong. No, I'm better. So it was very interesting to sort of like get two of them together and share the stories. Towards the end of the project, it just occurred to me that I completely forgot about my neighbour, Maggie Fife, who was central to the egg buyout. And I just thought, oh my God, I can't finish this project without, without recording her. So there's an entry about her and how she got, uh, she was head of the MBE in the 2009 News Year, New Year Orange List which she accepted on behalf of the community of Ed, whose vision, commitment and achievement she felt was also being honoured. I feel it belonged to the people of Ed as much as me, is what she said. So people were very important in the project, uh, but also local traditions were really important. So for instance, we talked about rum. I don't know if you've been to rum, but rum is very well known for its midges. And perhaps people didn't know that there was a place on the shore in Kinloch where uh, the midges are particularly bad. And when the Maclean's were layered on the island in the 18th, 17th century, 16th, 17th century, a man who had committed a crime was ordered to be stripped naked, tied to a stick and left exposed in this spot until he was stung to death by midges. The place was then said to be haunted with groans hard and night. Now, Rum, Rum's indigenous population has gone. It was moved away, shipped away to Australia in the 19th century, and it was really difficult to get these stories from, from Rum. Uh, but luckily, we had fantastic um, um, historians that have worked on Rum, like John Love, who were able to share the, first, the stories that they had themselves recorded and heard from people. So that was a, a really central part of the project, is to unearth these little gems. Like, for instance, did you know that uh, the main industry on rum in the 18th century was to gather wild goat's hair and send them to Glasgow to make wigs to be exported to America? <laughs> Islanders were paid one to two shilling a piece, and depending on the fineness of the hair. So an awful lot of things about uh, traditions, for instance, in, in uh, uh, you've seen the, the, the entry about the, the cats and Margaret Facial. Margaret Facial was another one of these colourful characters belonging to the small owls. But did people know that there was the St Michael's Feast day on Cana, like in the other islands? On the 29th of September, there would be a cavalcade of young people on the sands, on the horses. And um, uh, every man on the island mounts his horse bareback and takes behind him a young girl or his neighbor's wife, and the two of them ride back and forth from the village to a certain cross on the island. Once the procession is over, the ladies treat the companions of the right to a drink, and then it's time to retire home and share the Michael Mass banner string with the So sadly, a few years later, McNeil, the new owner of the island, put a stop to this old age old tradition, and that's also an important part of the of the curation of these stories because. What was important to me was to also talk about evictions. There was a big um, part of the project which was about migrations, but I felt it was really important to uh, to make sure that the stories of hardship, the stories of eviction, the stories of forced migration were told in the project. So, for instance, there's the story of um, the people of Kana, who were all um, rather the little island next to Kana called Sande, that were all taken away to the new world. And um, the names of the people cleared have all been forgotten, but what has passed down in the island tradition is the curse laid on the proprietor by the departing islanders. As Hector McNeil saw there, young Don McLean watched the people go, an old woman turned around to him and said, Higan la has, in fact, she can I The day will come yet that you will canna. We will leave Canada as poor as ourselves. And 30 years later, it came to pass, as Donald McLean 
that Nino was forced to sell the island to settle his debt. His debts, leaving for Tobomori and his children left Scotland for Canada in search of a better life. So, uh, perhaps we have another slide. You can see um, up there on the right the Cairn uh, commemorating the, the arc raids in Lewis. Uh, for me, it was very important to make sure that these stories were told so that visitors to the area would not just see the superficial um, stories or like, uh, you know, the tweed industry and everything like that. They would also understand what these cairns were, what these monuments were signifying in the landscape and discover the stories of hardship that they had um, uh, gone through. And that was part of the curation to gather all the stories of um, evictions and make sure that they were all there in the final project. Um, important also was to tell the story of people that are fairly marginal in the, in the culture of Scotland, the travelling people, and this is the heart of Argyll, the tinkered heart of Argyll, which is according to travelling um, tradition, goes back to the days after Culloden. Um, picture of smuggling. There were so many stories of smuggling, so many stories of smuggling throughout the, the curation process that, that came, came through. And that was just really fun to, to read and, and work on. And there's another story from Hannah that I'm going to tell you. There's always smuggling going on in those days. The brother of my grandfather, he used to smuggle. When the excise men used to come over after the smugglers to Canada by boat, there was a piper among the crew. And then when they landed, he used to play his pipes and the piper would go ashore and play the pipes all the way to Murdo's house and Murdo would hide everything. When the excise man arrived at Murdo's house, Murdo would ask him if he would like to have a drink. He would take him to the closet, take a bottle or two or three tumblers. That was not his itself. They were getting the stuff from October morning to Mull. Of course, there's quite a lot of hardship um, to do with um, the smugglers, uh, but um, they were very interesting too. To discover, and I hope that you will get the chance to discover. And I'll finish with um, the stories of piracy. So many stories of pirates in the in, in the islands, and this one is particularly well known to maybe some of you. It's John Paul Jones, who became a founder of the American Navy. But his uh, claim to fame in Scotland was that he got inside knowledge that a high-ranking Campbell was going home to Isla from India, laden with treasure, precious gems, and priceless artifacts. So we simply ambushed the packet boat, the equivalent of MacBrain's today, um, MacBrain's fair today, that was linking the island's mainland, and he robbed Campbell and his wife, leaving them standing in, the, in their own clothes in, within sight of the home in Isla. Uh, stories of Barise uh, and the pirates there that were able to, that had to make a living when they were um, chucked off the land by the uh, Mackenzie's um, invaders were also very interesting. Uh, and I do hope that maybe in the future, this coast um, treasure trove of stories will be mined by researchers, by filmmakers, by podcasters to make these stories more well known to the public at large. That's the... That's Brilliant. The Thank you so much. Had messages coming through there saying people saying that they could listen to you both all day. What better compliment than that? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so there's a couple of uh, questions that can be blended in here that have come through. I think rather than asking for any live questions from the room or from teams, just conscious of time um, that you can. Are you happy for questions at the break and over lunch and, and such like? And, and if anyone puts anything to the teams, then we'll, we'll come and, and ask. So. A um, couple of questions around, is it possible to still make contributions, um, although the project has ended? Well, that's a question for Katie really to reply. Um, I would say I will put my uh, email address in the chat and maybe it can be disseminated somehow to the people that are actually there in the room. Uh, the answer is yes, but we need to, to use a very specific template. <laughs> which is quite easy. It's quite easy to use. But if okay. anybody's really interested in doing that and wants to find out more, Great, thank you. then send me an email. 
OK, um, we will put your email address on the sign up table for the workshops. So we'll just pop that on a bit of paper there. If that's if that's how people can find it. Um, how long will the, the app and the website be maintained for? Till 2028, according to the current agreement. OK, lovely. Thank you. Um, have all the recordings uh, which weren't used in the project. You mentioned you had 1700, but only used 350. Have they been retained somewhere? So, oh, sorry, I'm being corrected. The website and app is live until 2030. A couple more okay. years there. Um, as for a pair of the kind of contributions that we got, we're in the process of archiving those. So those will be archived and accessible within the UHI archive. Um, and we do hope that maybe future projects will, um, or researchers will be able to use them. Yes. OK, then brilliant. And just very quickly, um, do you have any thoughts about how you use the professional storytellers in the project? Um, to be totally honest, this was something that was slightly outsourced. Um, our web developers had an existing relationship with um, a, a group of professional storytellers, so I don't have a great deal of insight into that. Um, I will say that most of our stories that we collected were not recorded. It wasn't really an oral history project, so we didn't have recordings of the story as told by the original contributors in most cases, though that would have been lovely, um, which is partly why the professional storytellers were brought on board instead. I hope that answers the question. OK, um, brilliant. Thank you. So um, it is break time and um, there has been a question as well about a hashtag. That was my fault. I did forget to read out the hashtag at the start. The hashtag is uh, celebrate CHC. Celebrate CHC. So there is lots of activity happening on Twitter. So if you want to head over there and uh, uh, use the hashtag, that would be wonderful. So the break goes on until 11.20. Um, teas, coffees, such like, and we're all here for the chat. If you've got any questions around, just come and find us at the break and we'll see you at 11.20. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> so. There we go. Okay, so that is us ready to start. I hope everybody enjoyed your teas and coffees. Thumbs up from Teams. Can you hear us okay? Yep, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, just to everybody that's in the Teams call, if you are not speaking or a BSL interpreter, um, it would be great if you could please turn your camera off. We've just had a wee bit of um, feedback that it's a little bit harder to focus on the BSL interpreter just with the other faces um, there. OK, thank you very much. So before the break, there was that theme of capturing people's stories, the oral history side of things. But what about the bricks and mortar? What about the objects that are all around us? And that's what we're going to be focusing on in this section now. So first up, we're going to be hearing about recording Scotland's closing churches. A race against time. And we're joined by DJ Johnson Smith, who is a heritage professional with academic research specialism in the dislocation and domicide experienced by communities in post war Edinburgh and the archaeological and historic landscape of southwest Scottish Highlands. His lifelong passion for Scotland's built heritage developed during his early years growing up in the Scottish Highlands and on the island of Isla and was further strengthened during his university studies. In, the, in Glasgow and Edinburgh. This love of Scotland's history and heritage has influenced many aspects of his career since, including his time spent as a historical consultant in local and national politics and as a community activist in the service sector, where he spent many years managing some of Scotland's best known um, hostility. I can't actually pronounce that word. Pubs. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Pubs. He joined Scotland's Churches Trust as a director in 2020. He is joined by Leslie Cumming. She is a retired chartered librarian with an honours degree in geography. She was head of information and library services for BP Exploration before leaving to raise a family. She subsequently worked part time as an indexer and abstractor and was assistant librarian at Tombridge School for 12 years. Since retiring and moving to Edinburgh with her husband, she used her skills widely in the voluntary sector. She won a National Trust for Scotland Volunteer of the Award in a Volunteer of the Year Award in 2016 for her work assigning gardens and landscapes um, in the Glorious Gardens of East Lothian Research Project. 
She was a founder member of Scotland's Churches Trust um, recording project, developing the methodology for the project and designing a template for the report. She enjoys training new church recording volunteers and is passionate about the need to record and celebrate the social history of communities as revealed through the contents of their places of worship. You sound like you're absolutely worth your weight in gold, Leslie. So first up, am I welcoming DJs? Thank you. Hello all. Uh, back next slide, please. Right, so this is just a very brief history. Uh, I'm going to give the, of our trust and, and why we're doing this project. Uh, so Scotland's Churches Trust, that came about in 2012 with the merger of two uh, of Scotland's best known ecclesiastical built heritage charities, the Scottish Churches Architectural Heritage Trust and Scotland's Churches Scheme. We have the next one. Uh, the Scottish Churches Architectural Heritage Trust, or SCAT, if you aren't aware of it, was founded by Magnus Magnusson in the late 70s. Uh, uh, its main aim was to dispense grant aid uh, to the Scotland's churches. Uh, uh, and advice the congregation for the upkeep and repair of their buildings. Can we have the next one? The Scotland Churches Scheme was founded in 1996 in East Lothian. Uh, uh, its first uh, director was Christine Milligan, and its principal aim was to get folk back into church buildings uh, out with service times. So these two charities, our, our heritage is really about looking after and sustaining these buildings and getting folk in there outside of uh, religious uh, um, observance. Uh, so, get to the next one. The main things we've done over the last 50 years, uh, uh, distributed over £3 million in small grants to churches, we've published numerous books and guidebooks, uh, created a national network of pilgrim routes, developed a series of how to guides, best practice, and conservation terms, and, and uh, how to interpret and how to share your story. And these days, in particular, we provide a digital concierge service that signed folks people using. Uh, um, on our website, which has about 1,500, in fact, uh, uh, buildings and, and churches across the country uh, so that people can find that when they get into them, uh, a little bit of their history and some uh, images of them. Um, the next one, please. So we're here today because of Changing Scotland. Uh, I've chosen this image here. This shows, this is John Cade's famous cartoon uh, portraying uh, uh, Alexander Webster, the great uh, statistician and minister in the Tollbooth Kirk in Edinburgh, these days are pretty much over of the packed churches on a Sunday uh, and at other times uh, uh, filled to the rafters. Um, can we have the next one? Uh, so, demographics in Scotland are very different today. Church membership, uh, Church of Scotland membership, that is the National Church, its uh, membership peaked in the late 1950s when roughly 1.3 million Scots or one in four were members. Uh, during this year's General Assembly, we had a stall there and we were listening to uh, discussions. They announced that their membership in 2021 was about 283,000, which is now one in 20, uh, and only around 60,000 folk attend Sunday services in person, which is the main time that you can actually get into a church building. Um, uh, they're, they're, on average, they're performing just one wedding and one baptism per year, and the average age of membership is 62. This has created a crisis in religious built heritage in Scotland. Thank you. I'm firing through these to give Leslie more time. Uh, the, this initiated a presbytery planning uh, 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 process in the Church of Scotland. These demographic, uh, demographic changes have affected uh, all denominations, but most significantly the Church of Scotland. So just prior to the pandemic, the onset of the pandemic, the institute uh, a period of presbytery planning, which saw the, uh, the presbytery, for those that don't know, this, this is the grouping of parishes. Uh, that oversees the running of the individual parishes. They've gone from, I think, the number was 42 down to 13, uh, and that rationalisation has uh, meant they've looked at their massive portfolio of buildings um, and other structures. Um, so this has meant uh, a, a massive uh, uh, period of upheaval. So there are currently around about 3,000 places of worship in Scotland. Uh, of all denominations and faiths, about a hundred of those or so are community-owned religious buildings, either former fully religious buildings or part religious buildings today. Um, by the end of this decade, about a third of those will have been sold. Um, within the next few years, 400 of them will have been sold, uh, and uh, some will go into other use. Some will uh, be partial uh, um, places of worship. Many will become private homes or private buildings or or. Fully other use. 
So we're about to experience a period of change in our religious built landscape that's not been seen since this period in, in the 19th century when the Bee Church uh, uh, appeared and created part of the of the of the religious landscape that we're seeing today with the, with the creation of a whole host of new churches. And we'll do it. So sadly, communities are learning about this too late. Sorry, Rosie, there's going to be a, a few to, few to press here to get all these to appear. I do apologize, there's an anim animations that I'd forgotten about that were like this. So these are uh, uh, just some of the stories that you've probably seen on your social media or your news feeds over the last year. Uh, most communities are learning about this just too late. Often when the for sale sign moves up, worst case scenario when a, when a fire takes place, uh, uh, one of the worst we saw, uh, sadly, was Lundy uh, in, in Angus, which was sold in November of 2021 and went on fire in November of 2022. Uh, the entire interior was destroyed. Uh, all, uh, all of the things that were left behind, the wood panelling, the memorials, everything gone. Uh, these are the worst case scenarios of what happens to a life after worship. But this is where we come in these days. We're talking to communities about the next stage for their lives. But part of what we're doing this project is to make sure that, that we don't have any more loss. We can't we can't guarantee against loss, but we must make sure there's a record of these stories because everything you heard in the first part of today was all about oral history. And what we are also doing is unpicking the intangible, the stories that are attached <coughs> because these buildings that were there in, in use there's been a church on that site since 1100. That building uh, was in use probably from since the mid 18th century, 250 years. Ten generations of local community investing in that building. So this project is to unpick those stories and make a record of it. Let's move. So what we're in danger of losing? Um, the vast majority of cases, the exterior fabric will remain. Uh, it's all of these items that are in the church, and there and, and the myriad of things. And let's talk more about that in a moment. But uh, it's so important that we don't lose it. Grab that next one. Thank you. Um, UNESCO have a very clear understanding of what tangible heritage and intangible heritage is. The intangibles of what are what we're going to lose here. Whether you're religious or not, I'm not a person of faith. Uh, there are people, uh, people of faith, obviously, but the, 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 this, this is what we're, we're going to lose. These items have been gathered there for 10 generations or more. There's one church that's threatened with closure. It's celebrating its 900th year this year in Scotland in Fife. It's got a, three years to sort out its community future. But that might not happen. We hope that it will happen. But that's 900 years of people investing in that building, stories, uh, objects. All of these objects have meaning and they will be scattered. We have the next. Uh, so we uh, in 2019, 20, we got wind of it. And uh, uh, the, 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 this, this change was coming. We weren't expecting it to accelerate to the rate that it has due to COVID. Uh, but we approached Historic Environment Scotland uh, for a little bit of seed funding to see if we can uh, create uh, 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 an emergency or rapid recording uh, process that will allow communities to make records of uh, these objects. Um, so we launched it in March of 2020 when something else came along at the same time, which made it, it somewhat uh, um, difficult. So we relaunched in autumn last year and we've, and we've created a methodology uh, that uh, um, we have next. Uh, a church recording methodology, which will um, we hope will help volunteers uh, ma make a record of a small church in about a day. Um, it's meant to be simple. It's not meant to replace the, the there's the, there's an amazing group of church recorders out there who will take months to meticulously record every aspect. This is meant to be a community initiative that can be done quickly, and and a record will be deposited in the Hess archives. And at this point, I'm going to pass over to Leslie so she can tell you more about the intent in front of them. Thank you, DJ. Hello everyone. Uh, yeah, well, I first got involved with uh, SCT through my husband Adam, who's now chair of our trust, uh, because he volunteered me to help with database entry in the office. But then this this project was mooted, and that sounded really much more interesting. We we like visiting churches anyway, so um, to 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 um to to um to to do this project was really just right up my street. Uh, can I slide, please? Um, some people are, including DJ, are, are very happy just wandering around graveyards, even if the church is, is shut. But for me, spending time inside the building and admiring the contents of the church, the windows, the textiles, the fonts, the pulpits is, is just great fun, great fun. And as a retired librarian, as you've heard, 
uh, cataloging and recording information is, is right up my street. Uh, next slide, please. So I thought I'd just volunteered to spend a day or so in each church writing notes and taking the photographs. But after a couple of trial recording sessions, um, I realised that I was in for more and, and I, I started uh, documenting the methodology and devising the template so each report could look could look very similar. And as DJ said, the um, project was started pre-pandemic. Uh, there was a trickle of churches being closed, but then post-pandemic, wham, this avalanche of potential closures. Um, so now I'm also involved with recruiting and training volunteers. And you, if you look on our YouTube site, you, you can see some of our webinars where, where we explain in detail the, the, the project. Um, but I have a problem now because I'm totally hooked. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's just such a sense of excitement every time we start recording the contents of a church. You know, what will we find today? Um, next slide, please. Um, we recorded the contents of Dissett Sinclair Church at the Fife. And what did we find? Charles Rennie Mackintosh murals. Who knew? Who knew? Uh, I should say that not all the churches we, we do record are closing. Some communities just want to do this project. Dissett Sinclair is not, is not closing. But unfortunately, Oldham Stocks Church in East Lothian is being closed. And I got very excited. Next slide, please. When I opened a best recovered and I found this beautiful sampler. So why do I think this project is so important? Next slide, please. That my own church and um, the architecture of Cram and Kirk is well documented. Uh, Cram has got an entry in the Buildings of Scotland volume on Edinburgh, um, for instance, but it's the contents we're interested in. And I'll tell you a funny story. Um, about my university entrance interview. Um, the professor of geography, he asked me to tell him about Northern Ireland, which is where I'm from. So I wax lyrical, I told him all about the geology and all about the landscape, thinking I'd really impress him and get my place. But when I finished, he just looked at me and said, but what about the people? <laughs> and that's exactly it for me. This church recording project is about the people and it's about the communities. Next slide, please. Because uh, they are the repository of the social history of their communities and it's just vital to record it and to make it publicly available. So we not only produce physical reports, but our data, as H he said, as H, uh, DJ said, will be available on the Canmore website. So although though we're doing rapid recording, hopefully, as other people have said, the data will be there for other, other people to pick up on and to do further, further research on. So as an example, let's fast forward to 2050. And there's a lady in Canada and she's researching her family history. She's traced her Scottish ancestry back to a little place called Dissett in Fife. She knows that in the past most folk were involved in their local church. She finds the Canmore database, does a search, puts in her family name ready, comes up with our church recording project and finds the family surname. Next slide please. So this is one of her ancestors called Lavinia Reddy. Who is, this, who is um, admired for her noble, unselfish and God-fearing life. Wouldn't you just love to have met Lavinia? I think she's an fearsome Victorian lady. Um, but back to the present. Um, what is our methodology? We have a, a simple online form. Next slide, please. Uh, with a series of drop down prompts to make things easy. This, of course, is on your smartphone and you're probably saying, but what if, what if the volunteers don't have smartphones? What if the church doesn't have Wi-Fi? Well, other methods are available. We do have paper and pencil, paper forms and pencils. And if, if a church is doing it via paper, then one volunteer can be um, appointed to take all the photographs and they can all be merged later. Um, when we're training volunteers, we always say, just imagine you're describing an object to someone who can't see and, and just paint a word picture of it. So it's not necessary to know all the technical terms. Curiosity is really the main thing. Just examine an object from all angles. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Innerwick Church, also closing. Um, we find a, a dedication, dedication plaque for this useful panelling. But where was it? It was down on the stroking board. Next slide, please. And that's that's it down there. But all of the folk in the church 
didn't even know it was there. So you have to be prepared to really look, get down on your hands and knees, do everything safely, move objects, look in cupboards um, and, and, and really look. Um, next slide, please. Finding that that dedication was a really good object lesson because we're often told, oh, there's not much to record in this church, but we always find lots. So you need to be there, prepared to be there for a whole day. Next slide, please. So not all churches have wonderful 15th century stone tombs, mm -hmm. but the contents of every church, they just reveal this wealth of information about the people who worship there and the importance of the Kirk to the local community. And once permission is granted, very important, uh, there are some practical considerations. Next slide, please. It can be cold, and I love this <laughs> <laughs> so wrap up warm, that's a lamb and your pipe organ at Roxborough Church now closed. And so tea, coffee, sandwiches, and I like to check that there are toilets as well. <laughs> um, next slide, please. We have 10 broad categories, so I'll just go through them briefly. Next slide, please. Uh, we have archival material. So example, proclamation of bands and shown here a, a register of services. Next slide, please. Library material, fairly self-explanatory, hymnals, prayer books, lectern bibles, looking cupboards to make sure that you know you're not you're not missing a nice Bible that might have a memorial inscription on it. Next slide. Memorials, very, very, very important. Um, you might think of just war memorials, but there are memorials to individuals. They can be mounted on walls. Um, they can be small metal plaques, even on communion tables. But this is an unusual one because it's on the back of a lectern fall. And if I hadn't turned that lectern fall over, I would have missed it. Uh, next slide. Metal work. This is a huge um, category. So obviously communion cups, flagons, dishes, book rests, baskets, vases, because sometimes people uh, uh, donate a vase to, to in memory of a loved one and the old communion tokens as well. Miscellaneous. You have to have a miscellaneous category. <laughs> That, that's a, a, a merchant company plaque. Uh, musical instruments, that's self-explanatory, but that's a nice one because that's from a church in, in, in Shetland and that's a case where a local group of volunteers, I didn't go, use, used our methodology to record their local churches. So that's what we're trying to do, get groups all around Scotland doing working in their own, in their own areas. Paintings, also self-explanatory self really. Um, Textiles, next slide, my favourite one. These are seat cushions from the Sinclair, but look at the work that's gone into those. Uh, windows, again, huge, huge topic because a lot of them are memorial windows. Uh, wooden furnishings, next slide. A fairly plain chair, but see, it's got a memorial plaque, so that all needs to be, be recorded. Um, the online form then tells you what information to enter. Are there any makers mark? Where is the item in the church? What's it made of? What size is it? Um, record all the memorial plaque. You see, it's a bit, it's having curiosity. It's just a bit like plain detective. In my own church, I thought we used quite plain offering plates. Next slide, please. And one day I turned it over, having used it for years, taking the offering up, turned it over. It's got a memorial inscription. You know, you really have to look. Um, so now that I am a church recording volunteer, um, I, I find I've been much more observant when, when I'm going around everywhere, um, even walking around Edinburgh. You know, oh, I've seen this. Uh, but next slide, please. Um, I visited this church, this Crichton Collegiate Church. I visited it several times, but only recently. Have I noticed the mouse? <laughs> <Down the bottom? laughs> yeah. And that's obviously from the, the mouseman, the Robert Tom Thompson's. Um, craft workshop in, in Yorkshire and I was also in a church at Christmas. Next slide, please. And uh, I spotted another one. I was singing car carols and I suddenly thought, oh, I spotted another one. So you really learn to be to be much more observant. The, the more of this you do, the more the more you learn. And another slide. Um, these brass plates, again, a good example. Um, they're very nice, but we turn them over and one of them's got a dedication. Um, they're arts and crafts, obviously, 
Um, it says gifted to Christophan Parish Church, made by Agnes S. Boyd. And this is where I hope other researchers will will follow follow on using our data. Because who was Agnes? How did she learn to do that? Was it just a hobby for her? You know, but at least now we've documented her achievement. We, we'll put it up on Canmore and then, you know, she will be celebrated. So that's great. So next slide, please. So that's my slogan. Church recording is rewarding. <laughs> next slide, please. Um, this has been a brief look through, but we have a full recorder's handbook. So if you want to know more, uh, please, please ask us for a copy uh, and we'd be very happy to give you one. And next slide, please. Thank you very much. And do you have any questions? <laughs> Well, that was really great um and yes is the answer to that there's lots of questions <laughs> okay um well first of all do we have any live questions does anyone want to raise their hands yep first of all that just sounds so much fun so I'm very jealous. Do get involved get involved hashtag what was it yeah. church recording is rewarding for the churches that are closing that have tangible items and um, we've got partnerships with local museums for example that these pieces can then be safeguarded for the future and um, because i run a local museum for example and i know that i would want to make sure that it's state local and is accessible to local people if it couldn't remain in the in the building itself well i think the, the simple answer from that is that we don't own the buildings we're not the church of scotland and um, so what we encourage our uh, volunteers to do is, is talk you must bear in mind that every item that we turn the church upside down uh, all the items that, that are loose belong to the congregation. Mm -hmm. When the congregation is dissolved, it, it, it then stays with the building. Um, so it, it's really it's incumbent on, for example, a local authority to reach out to that congregation and say we would perhaps be keen to offer a home for these items, whatever that may be, because at the moment the congregations are in free fall and they don't know that they have the contacts because it's been such a retraction over the last 20 years. So we're encouraging all congregations to do exactly that, to reach out, but sometimes they need someone to reach out to them as well. So if you know, uh, we, we can, you can get in touch with us at lunch and I can give you a, a, a list of the churches we know and maybe in your area mm -hmm. that are closing and you can maybe make that, that connection. They'd love to hear from you, I think. OK, great. Was there another hand going up? Yep. It's a new hand. It wasn't there before. Um, I, I was just wondering, I mean, I, I come from a different tradition, so I don't know how, how the Church of Scotland works on this, but do they not have surveys of the artefacts and the materials and the fabric and the contents of the church? Do they not do that? Um, they, there's, a, there's a version of it, that, and uh, as they're closing, there's an inventory being done, but the inventory isn't necessarily as thorough as we might like it's, it's perhaps it, it can be quite subjective if your minister is being tasked with doing it he might or she might decide that it's only certain items worth recording we have turned up at some of our recordings and, and there's been a tidy before we arrived yeah. uh, uh, and these items are now oh you would have been interested in all that correspondence from the 1930s uh, uh, between the minister and the florists and the minister and the undertaker which has not been um, uh, so th this uh, there isn't I, I, I shouldn't. I should also stress it's not just the Church of Scotland. Mm. All traditions are, clo uh, are closing. So Episcopalians are closing their churches. Catholic Church are closing their churches. This is happening right across the board uh, in Scotland and in England. There's a Save Our Parish group op operating in England, definitely trying to reverse this process. So it's right across the board. These religious. Yeah. I mean, yes, but the Episcopal Church has their quinquennial surveys. Yes. And but, certainly those are quite detailed. I mean, they go through every window, every piece of furniture, every piece of stuff that's being kept in the church. I guess it might be locally dependent, but certainly the ones I've seen have been really detailed. And the Church of Scotland, the quinquennial surveys are, tend to focus more on, on the buildings right. um, and not, not, not so much in, on the content. Yeah. And that's important, gutters, ceilings and so on, but yeah. for the items, not so much. OK, thank you. Was there any live questions coming from the team's room? Are they all? They're all on Slido. Yeah, both on Slido. OK, perfect. Thank you very much for that. And um, there's a couple of questions around community uses. So when you record the contents, do you also record how the community uses the building? Uh, we'll record anything that people care to share with us and put that into the notes that will be transferred into your own archives. 
Okay, so but does it does it talk about the kind of importance of place and what the hall might be used for if it, if the space? It, it's not an no, old history project. No, no. that way we're, right. we're 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 really if this is an emergency uh, recording session looking at items. Oh, okay. uh, and and but if people choose to give us stories, we will make a make a rough and add it to the notes. Yeah. that hasn't happened yet, but mm -hmm. we're uh, we'll 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 keen our our recorders will take anything. Okay, what happens to the objects that can't be sold? They stay with the church. They stay with the church. Uh, it's just a very simple uh, because of listing planning consents. For example, windows is a big thing that, that people talk about a lot. We've been to a small church in Angus that that hopes that there'll be public access to the war memorial window afterwards. You need listed building consent to remove an exterior window. That's just often beyond the means of the surviving half a dozen congregation to to arrange all of that to put a new window in its place uh, and then safely store that window until the next opportunity to use it again. So these items are staying. Um, we recorded one church that had the contents of six previous churches in it um, uh, already. That church is now likely to close, so that will be seven churches contents perhaps losing their churches can't take all of these items. OK, great. Um, there's a lot of questions that are coming through the slider. We're definitely not going to get through all of them. What time are you heading off today? <laughs> You're all day. We're all day. So I'm just thinking because at four o'clock between four and five, there is an optional networking session. I'm not sure if you have to head off exactly at four, but I think it could be that because there'll be questions for, for teams about answering these. Um, maybe we could do something with a breakout room at four for anyone on teams who wants to hear these questions answered. We could maybe do a bit of a hybrid approach with any questions that haven't been answered. Something that Slido doesn't let you do at the moment is for yourselves to log in yourselves and answer them. So that's something we're going to reflect on. But I think we'll just have a chat throughout the day about being able to, to get answers out. Does that sound like a plan? OK, then. Brilliant. Thank you so much. OK, wonderful. So next up, leaving a mark on history, the Mason's Marks of Scotland. And we're going to welcome up Ian Ross Wallace. And um, now Ian classes himself as a late comer to the study of archaeology, though it has been a lifelong interest. He undertook the certificate in field archaeology course in 2010-12 and followed this with an MA in archaeological archaeology and a research master's investigating the stone Mason's Marks of the early medieval castles and religious um, buildings of Scotland. He leads the Scottish Stone Masons Marks Research Project and is a contributing author to the Carved Stones of Scotland's project. In addition to his academic research, he is a public speaker on a range of subjects and convener of the Langside Community Heritage. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, my interest in Mason's Marks be, uh, began uh, by accident, as many of these things do, um, with a visit to Kirkston Castle when I was uh, serving for the National Trust. Um, and I had what's usually referred to as a light bulb moment where I spotted a stone Mason's Mark uh, on the fireplace. Um, and I managed to squeeze a two year research master's project out of that uh, <laughs> Mason Mark. <laughs> Um, I was a bit surprised to discover when I started that there's been very little done in the way of um, recording Mason's Marks in Scotland. There's only one other project recently. Um, most of what has been done was done in the antiquarian period where there was sort of sketch notes, which some of which are on Canmore, um, listing marks that were found um, by sight, but without any, um, any real assessment or, or analysis. Most of the work um, that has been done on Mason's Marks in the UK is in England and Wales. Matthew Champion, who leads the project uh, uh, down there, um, tends to lump stone Mason's Marks in with church graffiti. Um, and I hope that in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be able to convince you to agree with me that that's wrong. <laughs> OK, next slide. So what is a Mason's Mark? Well, it's simply put, it's a sequence of lines carved into it a dress piece of stone to show the information about the person who worked that stone. And here you can see three different marks, uh, the arrowhead and the three pointed uh, star and, and my favourite on the end, M010 as it's, as, it's, um, uh, as it's known in the index, the bow tie. 
Um, we very often talk about Bishop so and so built this castle, or Lord so and so built. Sorry, Bishop uh, so and so built the built the cathedral, and Lord so and so built the castle. And of course, it wasn't them. They got the charter, and they may well have paid for it. Um, but it was the masons that carved the stones that created the building. And that's what we're going to try and, and explore a little bit now. Next one, please. I feel like Chris Whitty doing it. <laughs> um, why do stone masons' marks exist? Well, there, there are a number of different reasons. First of all, quarry marks. Stones coming from a quarry to a site are marked with a code to identify which quarry th they are going to. Bear in mind that I'm talking way back. 1132, 1124, when David became king, um, David I, um, quarries were already cutting stone for buildings um, and it very much in the Anglo-Norman side. So the quarry marks would appear on the stone, the stone would go to the site and then the stone would be cut and dressed. Next one, please. And here we have the, the, the other, the next one is banker's marks. Now banker's marks are the mark that the mason puts on the stone when he's finished cutting it to size. Um, so the marks that you will see on buildings uh, is the mark of the person who cut the stone to fit the space that it went into. Some marks may well be position marks, although they tend not to be visible uh, once the stone is in position. Um, and the arrow that you saw in the previous slide um, I initially thought was a position mark until I, until I discovered some of them in the same part of the building with the arrow upside down or pointing to the side. And I realized that was a mason's mark and not a position mark. Marks were used for quality control and also to monitor production rates and payment. To give you an idea, a mason cutting uh, what's known as an ashlar block, which is a rectangular block, maybe twice the size of that, um, would cut six or seven of those in a day. So it wasn't a huge output um, and it was important that they were done correctly. So the marks would be put on the stone so that the person who was monitoring and, and arranging payment would know that the individual had actually earned their keep. OK, so where do the marks come from? Well, I disappeared down a rabbit hole with this one. Um, I met Kathleen Jamie, who's a professor of poetry uh, at Stirling University on a visit to Glasgow Cathedral. And um, we decided that marks are of runic origin. I mentioned David the First. David the First had grown up in the English court, um, which was heavily Anglo-Norman influenced. Where did the Normans came from? They were the Norsemen. They came from Scandinavia, who were the Vikings. So the the symbols for the alphabet, the elder and younger Futaks, followed them south into what is now Normandy across the channel into Anglo-Norman England and then north into Scotland when David became king. The Normans didn't have to invade Scotland. David held the door open and let them in after him. Next slide, please. And here we have the two, the two foot arts. And as you see, there are some differences between the marks that were used in the elder foot arc, the older uh, symbols and the younger. Now bear in mind there's only three or four hundred years between the two and we are talking about something that's a thousand years old now uh, minimum. Um, and there will have been overlaps but there are many many similarities and also many differences. Um, 17 of the elder marks have been seen as mason's marks and 18 uh, of the younger marks. Um, and they're very simple because they're straight lines, so they can be easily carved onto stone or wood and very often used in timber construction as well. And um, here we have um, some letters in the elder foot art and the younger foot art, and you can see that there are differences. So following it through can be quite complex. But let's say for sake of argument uh, that somebody's called David, is a stonemason. He would use one or other of these symbols to sign his name on the piece of stone that he worked. And that would be him signing his name. We've got an illiterate population, the only people who could read and write, 
uh, at the time scale that, that, that I'm talking about, 12th and 13th century, would be clerics uh, in abbeys and, and cathedrals, um, and they would mostly be literate in French and Latin. So the symbols were very important and it was a matter of pride. Um, one of the masons at Glasgow Cathedral said he doesn't put his mark on many stones, only the worthy ones. <laughs> he says he has worthy stones and he has stones he gets paid to make. Um, I'm not quite sure what HES would say about that. He said it has to be completely perfect and no flaws in the stone in the natural material. Or he doesn't put his signature on it. Next one, please. So what can Mason's marks tell us? Well, quite a lot of things. Um, we can find out about the size of the skilled workforce. Glasgow Cathedral, 452 different Masons have been identified. Um, we found 1182 marks, uh, so many marks appearing uh, repeatedly. We can look at distributions of patterns within and across sites. In Glasgow Cathedral, we might find a Mason's mark on an ashlar block in the nave low down and then up in the in the uh, triforium, the first gallery around the nave, we might find the same mason's mark on a more complex piece of stonework, perhaps, perhaps a window or door archway. That would tell us that the mason who originally worked on the ground floor has developed his skills to the point where he's making a slightly more complex, uh, I mean, a slightly more complex piece of stone. Um, it also tells us about the mobility of the workforce and a, a word of caution here. The same mark at two different sites doesn't necessarily mean the same mason. Average life expectancy, 40 plus slightly in the 12th century. Um, working on a building the size of Glasgow Cathedral or a castle like Stirling or Edinburgh without scaffolding, probably <laughs> about 20. <laughs> Work it out for yourselves. Um, and you, of course, there's no retirement plan and, and there's no disability. So you carry on working as best you can until you drop dead. And, uh, and perhaps literally, if you're up in the fear story. Um, so Mason carried on working and wouldn't necessarily travel from site to site. But of course, if they're using the runic symbols as the basis of their signature, there's an awful lot of people with a, a name beginning with D or G or F or whatever it might be. So the repetition of the same symbol being used in different places. Um, and finally, the possibility of, of family connections. Um, this is quite a complex one. Um, I'll come back to that in, in, in a minute. Uh, next one, please. Um, here's some simple examples of, uh, of three um, marks, uh, all of these found at Glasgow. And the next one, very complex, 12, 12 lines, middle one. Um, you have to ask yourself what it was about that mason that made him think it was all right for him to spend all that time carving that. <laughs> because it takes time and it's a necessary evil. He doesn't get paid for doing that. He gets paid for cutting the next stone. So he wants a simple, straightforward Mason's mark. And the interesting thing is that these three marks on the bottom there were all found at the north doorway, Glasgow Cathedral, the doorway into the, the, the landing between the, the lower church and the upper church. And I'll come back to talk a bit more about those in the next slide, please. So I mentioned the family connection. If your son um, becomes a Mason, great stuff. <laughs> but you can't use your mark. He might be George Jr. The cross on the left is the, is the runic symbol for the letter G. So if your name's George, you use the cross. If his, he's called George as well. He can't use the cross because he would want to be paid separately to his dad. So he might add a line and you can see what happens here, how complex it gets. We take the same basic mark and we add some lines and we end up with with another eight, seven different Mason's marks. And um, so it really is a bit of a, a bit of a trail. And uh, next, please. Mason's marks at Glasgow Cathedral, total marks found. 
500, sorry, these have been updated since, uh, since um, the, I gave you the original figures. Um, 421 marks at Glasgow that weren't found anywhere else. And we spent 650 hours surveying. So quite a lot of work gone into this by an awful lot of people who volunteered um, to put up with me going on about Mason's month. And it was one of those. Chris Whitty never had to put up with him. <laughs> there you go. Pretty graph. This very clearly demonstrates that most of the marks have three, four or five lines, which is understandable because you want to keep it as simple as possible. And um, there are some, the, the, the most complex was, was 14. Um, and there was two found with that number. Next slide, please. I mentioned skill patterns uh, and distributions. This one here um, found at Glasgow and found in all of these places on the south end wall of the choir, on the lower church, uh, on pillars, on an external door frame, on the stairwells, stairway up to the triforium and external to the west door. So that mason was very busy doing a lot of different work there. And that was found at, um, also found at Bodwell and there was 10 occurrences of that there. Um, the next one, please. Go and just click through. And here you can see the same mark appearing in slightly different formats at a number of different uh, venues. The next, please. Uh, here's something different. The rule, one stone, one piece of stone, one mark, doesn't apply always. As usual, you know, local variations will apply. Here we have three complex marks and they appear on, on stones next to each other, two marks on each stone. Why? We don't know. Uh, nobody's ever done this before, so I decided why. <laughs> and the answer is that these are the master masons who oversaw the work. The north door was the main entrance to the church for uh, the religious um, brothers who, who worked at the cathedral. Uh, so he put his mark on the outside of the building to say, I approve of this. Uh, next one. Um, OK, just run through them, please. Um, putting an end to the mark is almost impossible. The People of Medieval Scotland website has Mason's mark, Mason's information, um, but it's very complex and it's very difficult to identify. It's a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle where there isn't a picture. On, on the pieces, I mean, not just on the box. Um, and as I said already, not all the marks are the same and not all the marks are different. So if anybody can come up with an answer how to fix it, actually we're all lighting. <laughs> okay, so what's next? And this is rather the point of this. Um, having completed a research masters and, and generated hundreds and hundreds of drawings, um, this project, is a way of getting local communities and visitors to heritage buildings to engage with the building and have some understanding about how it came about. Um, it builds a sense of ownership, it's hands on, it's learning opportunities for all ages, worksheets for schools, for example, and so on and so forth. Lots of different things. Next one, please. So here we are. Here's how you can get in touch. Masonsmarks.scot. Um, we're on Facebook. Who isn't? Um, don't do any of the youngsters type. Is it Instagram? Don't do that. Don't understand it. Um, I waste enough time on this on Facebook as it is. I've just realised that it should be there should only be one S in Marks. Um, and that's my Masons Mark. I designed my own Masons Mark <laughs> just because I can. So finally, I would like to thank Kim. Um, as I said, the, the, the hundreds of people who participated in this, volunteers from Glasgow University, um, from Glasgow Archaeological Society, from ACFA Field Archaeology, um, from HES, um, the, the um, guides at Glasgow Cathedral who really didn't know what they were letting themselves in for, um, but they got in places that they're not normally allowed. So I was, I, I gained a bonus point there. That's it. Thank you very much indeed. Another absolutely fascinating 
talk. Thank you so much. So a couple of questions here through Slido, but first of all, is there any live questions from the Teams room that anybody wants to ask? Yep, get them all on Slido. Perfect, thank you. Any hands up in this room? Yep, go for it. Is this a tradition that's still continuing? Yes, it is. I'm very proud to see that, that there's a question up there as well. Um, Masons traditionally do put their marks on the stones that they work. The requirement to put a mark on is no longer essential because people aren't paid on a day rate. Uh, the more the Mason did, the more he got paid. So if he did seven and his apprentice cut one, he would get the apprentice to put his mark on the on that stone as well, and he got paid for eight that day. Mm -hmm. Right? That doesn't happen now. People are employed uh, in, a, in a very different way. Um, so uh, rather sadly, Historic Environment Scotland have instructed their stonemasons not to put their marks. Good, I'm glad I got that reaction. <laughs> on the on the visible face of a new stone even if the building has mason's marks from previous repairs or in the original construction uh, at the risk of poking the sleeping tiger how many of you think that's right oh right okay good. <laughs> well that's unanimous um i don't understand why they do that and neither does one of the master masons at, at uh, hgs that i've spoken to i think it would be nice in the future 50 100 200 years for somebody to come along and say, oh, that's a new stone. Oh, there's a mason's mark on that. I wonder about him. Their argument is there's a digital record in a computer in Edinburgh with all that information on it, which is, isn't accessible to us public or to very many people in the <laughs> So I would really like to change that. A lot of commercial um, masons do put their marks on it. There's an apocryphal story of the man who uh, had millions of pounds, bought a castle, had it all done up, had a new fireplace constructed and the mason did the fireplace and the guy came back a week later to see the fireplace and right in the middle uh, of the, the arch of the fireplace was a great big mason's mark <laughs> and the man said what have you done that for you've ruined the fireplace he said you wouldn't buy a Rembrandt without a signature would you? Yeah. There you go. Uh, okay. Which um, is marks yep. and yeah graffiti but yeah if I can just wrap all these the, those two in together um, it is relatively easy to tell if uh, they are graffiti or witches marks or, or a portrait. A, a portrait. A no. portrait. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, well, close enough anyway. So the man in the right. Um, and uh, because Mason's marks don't have curved lines, almost everything else does. So if it's graffiti or witches marks or memento mori then they will have a different shape and form and there will very often be letters um from from uh, the roman alphabet mm -hmm. another one there marks made by cartographers ah right marks made by cartographers benchmarks that's the horizontal line with the arrow underneath it very often with bm and a date or bm and the height <laughs> above sea level there's one at the top of my road um, on the wall of the building there. Um, I don't record those because they are there for a different purpose. They're not to do with the construction of the original building. Um, and Mason's marks are still used today in, in a lot of places, although very differently. Glasgow, uh, sorry, Paisley Abbey was rebuilt 1917 and a lot of the new stone has Mason's marks on them. Um, so it's still and it's still in use today. Brilliant. OK, are you around all day? I am. Brilliant. Yes. So any more questions? Catch up at the lunch and, uh, and at other points. Brilliant. Thank you so much. OK, quite excited about this. <laughs> Next up is One Minute Mayhem. So for any of you that have been at the conversations that have happened over the past couple of years online or at the Community Heritage Conferences, um, in person before the lockdowns, you will know all about One Minute Mayhem. So a quick fire one minute open mic session, your opportunity to share your projects, initiatives, achievements, or even just your views. So that as people have signed up in advance, 
or you can come down on the day. So we're going to run through the people that have signed up first. We have some slides, but as you're watching this, raise your hand and I'm going to pass over to Efoil as the one minute host. Thank you, Rosie. And uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me up at the back? And can you hear me in uh, the Western Isles? Yeah. <laughs> good, good, right. Um, Rosie, to explain this, it's dead simple. Uh, you have 60 seconds to talk about anything heritage related. And when the time's up, I squeeze the horn and you start off. OK, there's no discussion, no questions or anything. But the point of this is to uh, try. It's, it's an opportunity for those who are here in person to introduce themselves to the audience. And you can maybe catch up in the lunch queue. Yeah. And for those watching online, perhaps you can in the chat and so on, you can uh, find out well, uh, where to get in touch with any of our uh, rapid fire speakers. OK, so um, we're just going to plow into this because time's getting on. And first up um, is uh, Rachel Dorman, uh, who um, works uh, in HGS here in the engine shed and and is uh, come on our down. host for the day. Rachel, come on down. And <laughs> Hello. So you're. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll say. Do I just say go? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy. Uh, your minute starts now. Hello, everybody. I am Rachel Dorman, the program Hello. delivery manager at Engine Shed, and welcome to our beautiful building that we call home. So, the work that we do here, the work that I do, is to put on and support these lovely people to create an event that you guys can all come to. That includes conferences, training, workshops. Um, oh, I think I'm getting. <laughs> get <it. laughs> Quick, the counter's counting. <laughs> so, what I will say is that we now have a full programme that is planned that you can engage in. So, whether you're within the sector, an enthusiast, um, or just really kind of interested in a bit of geek, please feel free to have a look on our What's On page um, and you can sign up to these events which are on between now and December. Please. Yeah. Well done. Now. <laughs> right, right, we're going to have to cut this down to you know fifty seconds of mayhem when people keep doing this. Um, right. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, next we have Sarah Pierce from the Heritage Trust Network, who is online, and there she is. Fantastic. Um, are we ready to go, Sarah? Can you unmute Absolutely. yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Your minute starts now. Hi everyone. Are you looking for a volunteer role for yourself? Do you have volunteers working with your organisation? Are you a volunteer manager? Well, Make Your Mark is a campaign that aims to increase the number and diversity of heritage volunteers in Scotland. It's run by a partnership of sector leading organisations, including Historic Environment Scotland, Nature Scott, Volunteer Scotland and many more. The campaign offers free resources looking at heritage volunteering opportunities. In particular, it connects heritage volunteer coordinators across the country. It hosts free events. It shares inclusive volunteering practice, celebrates volunteers and most importantly, it promotes volunteering opportunities on a free matchmaking platform. That's right, free online platform where you can find <laughs> opportunities. And yeah, look at makeyourmark.scot. Uh, Oh, well done. This is just too easy. <laughs> How are you going to get on then, Rosie? Because well, next we have, well. we have Rosie, our Rosie, uh, who's also going to talk about Make Your Mark, which can I make, they've got a two minute mayhem. Ooh, is it? I know. But the judges have allowed this. Um, and if you're ready to go, Rosie, your uh, minute starts now. Brilliant. So Rosie has just set the platform for Make Your Mark. So as well as being on this event committee, I'm also the chair of the Make Your Mark uh, Events Action Group and vice chair of the Make Your Mark campaign. So I am here all day to answer any questions about Make Your Mark and will be at the end of the day. But what I really want to promote to you is our Hot Off the Press Volunteer Managers Conference 2024. It's going to be called Inclusion at Every Stage. Now, as you can see, it's going to be on the 29th of February at the Engine Shed and again will be fully hybrid. So. We're only about two weeks into our planning, but on the agenda, we are going to be looking about um, inclusion ready approach, how you communicate authentically within a, communi uh, within a community, using their own methods and styles, 
um, about relationship management with volunteers, being sympathetic to different backgrounds needs. We'll have the um, Jambo Radio, Scottish Refugee Council, um, Disability Scotland, lots of different organisations that can share their skills and learning. <laughs> right. Um, number four, Nicola McHenry, who is from the, 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 the Scottish Community Heritage Alliance. Shah, I learned at Peabury. Thank you. I went for a much more frantic approach to this one. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, Nicola, tell us something about uh, the Scottish Community Heritage Alliance in just a minute, starting now. Uh, Shah was set up by and for people who worked in community heritage in Scotland and what was once a province of small traditional museums and heritage is now a diverse and lively sector doing everything from managing nationally important assets to delivering projects around intangible culture and heritage. It's thriving and demanding and to us it's the most exciting growth area in Scottish heritage. Now we work with Hez and the other big players but we support people with their boots on the ground and we believe that a bottom-up collaborative approach is best. We create a community heritage network which can represent community voice at a national level. We hold meetups, conduct research, advocate on the national stage, collaborate and share skills, all with the aim of creating positive change within this sector. We break down barriers and we collaborate across disciplinary boundaries. We advocate for better opportunities where they're most needed and marginalised communities who have historically been underrepresented and underfunded for arts and cultural activities. With this, we aim to foster not only a sense of community ownership, but a cultural shift. One in which heritage is an instrument for social innovation, where we redistribute authority, expertise, agency and representation, one where the communities hold the power. So join us and get your voice heard now. It's free. <laughs> and you will, all, you will also be here all day, is that right? You've got info and you'll be here for the informal networking at the end to chat about it. Brilliant. Um, Jenner, Gerard Lohan from the Aviation Preservation Society of Scotland, is that right? That's right. Um, well it's going to talk about a plane. This is exciting. <laughs> um, yes, <sir>. So, <laughs> Gerard, if you're ready to go, uh, then your minute starts now. Right, 23 years ago, the National Museum of Flight asked some elderly volunteers of the APSS whether they could build a flying full-sized World War One aircraft for their collection. <laughs> now, the old boys, and no money, and they'd never built an aeroplane before in their lives. Of course, they said yes. <laughs> and 23 years later, here we are. She's about to fly. Um, <laughs> don't waste my time. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's an incredible achievement. But I want to make clear that she's not just an aeroplane. She's actually got so much more to offer. When you see the reaction from young people, old people who come to see her, you can see the effect it has on them. And we want to bring that back into the community. We want to bring her out into the community. And we want to involve the community in her future. Now, we're not uh, recreating heritage, not bringing back heritage like these guys have done brilliantly. We're actually hand building heritage. And there she is. <laughs> That's the tiny, it's impeccable today, isn't it? Um, Julianne McGraw. From oh, is that not the right one? I've got them the wrong way around. Um, actually, then Barry, you're on Barry Maxwell. Yeah. <laughs> you can improvise. <laughs> I guess it wrong. Um, Barry Maxwell from the National Museum of Scotland. Um, your minute starts now. Okay, hello. I'm a design archaeologist. I've just started at National Museum of Scotland as curator of modern and contemporary history, so I'm using these few seconds to say hey. Um, and also to let you know about our contemporary collecting hub, so really nice to meet you. Um, the National Museum of Scotland's always been a museum of the past present, but I would also add looking to the future. So therefore I have one foot in the past, one foot in the now, and my gaze looking ahead. <laughs> um, I believe that by understanding the diverse material culture of the past, we can build more resilient communities, a strong sense of belonging, and also we can learn from designers of the past to build sustainable and equitable futures. I've loved the papers today. And um, recent acquisitions include a brick made of recycled waste, um, a banner made by the group Craftivists, contemporary tartan garden garments, tampons, and this AA27 road sign. <laughs> I'm looking forward to work with communities to document continuities, changes, challenges that we embrace and face in Scotland today. Please come say hello. Thank you, thank you very. Um, oh, it is, it's Julianne 
it's, it's on now. And Julianne is joining us online. Julianne, how are you doing? Good, thanks. How about you? OK, um, if you're ready, your um, minute starts now. Yeah, I'm Julianne from the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland Dig It Project, which is primarily funded by HES. I'm here to invite anyone who will be coordinating archaeological fieldwork next summer to participate in our annual Scotland Digs Awareness Raising campaign, which helps deliver on Scotland's archaeology strategy. This year's campaign involved more than 20 fieldwork events coordinated by a range of community heritage groups and other organizations who benefited from a free webinar on barriers to participation, press coverage, Wikipedia uploads and edits, podcast appearances, and more. Fieldwork organizers have reported that engaging with previous campaigns has been valuable for a variety of reasons, including gaining more online followers and subscribers and or because people found their events because of the campaign. It's completely free for you and you don't need to be running a public event to get involved. For more information, contact us through digitscotland.com. Well done, well done, well done. Um, right, this is what, what's next. I'm not taking anything for granted. Ah, right, good. Um, Anna uh, Kvorov from Nourish Scotland. The floor is yours. Thank you. And um, uh, you have 60 seconds to nourish us. We can start thinking. No, thank you. So my name is Anna. I'm from Nourish Scotland, and we're just starting a new project looking at the history of state subsidised public diners in Britain. They run during the 1940s and 50s under the banner of British restaurants, but some of them continued well into the 70s. Uh, they offered nutritious price cap menus to general public. They were incredibly popular. Uh, we had almost two and a half thousand of them across the country. Uh, there were six in the city of Dundee alone. Um, uh, and at their peak, there was more of them in Britain than we have McDonald's today. Also nearly as much as we have food banks today. Um, and far from being soup kitchens, they were described as centers of civilization. Some of them had art from Buckingham Palace hanging on the walls. Uh, we think they were a key piece of social infrastructure that we need to bring back. Uh, and we want to learn from that history. So if you've heard of them, if you've dined in one, if your mum worked in one, or you're just interested in them, I would love to hear from you. Thank you. I, I, I can't get over the timing. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, today, um, this, is, uh, this is, yeah, easy, isn't it? Uh, right, well, I'm rather hoping that uh, Elena uh, Tremarki from the National Museums uh, is going to burst through one of these doors right now. <laughs> she's on her way from Glasgow, where she had a meeting she couldn't get out of, but no, can we just move on? We also have time at the end as well of the day to do any other one minute mayhem that people might want to do, so hopefully yeah, we'll yeah. get her in then. Can we? That one's on. So, if anybody likes to come down, down. Oh, you've got something to say. <laughs> I haven't prepared anything. Sorry. <laughs> the best stuff in a minute. Uh, okay, the floor is yours starting now. Hey, I'm Lisa Sneddon. I work with Keep Scotland Beautiful. We have just launched a development year project called Our Heritage, Our Future, funded partly by the Sword Environment Scotland and National Lottery Heritage Fund. One element of it is delivering skills sessions, SVQs. It's a level two SVQ in cultural heritage, meaning it's accessible to everybody. We have previously worked with 15 year olds who couldn't access education, all the way through to people who were looking for a second, third, fourth career later on in life. Activities are things like guided tour training, how to present in public, which is <laughs> um, creating pop up museums, how to explore archives. Um, previously with Archaeology Scotland, we've helped give qualifications to people going on their digs. Um, so if anyone's working with groups, um, it's completely free. We cover all the charges. And um, we also cover participation costs like buses, if they need PPE, that kind of thing. I'm here all day. Please get in touch. <laughs> any more? Any, are there any online? Oh, we've got a couple of volunteers. Is there an online volunteer? Anyone? Yep. No one yet? No one yet? Maybe after. Yes. It's two or three of you here. Can I just uh, can I just acknowledge? Um, thank you so much to BSL interpreters for really, <laughs> really trying your hardest. Um, and we have we have also just had a wee bit of feedback from the teams room that people are going a bit too fast for them to follow and hear, and also just for the interpreters. So we'll take that on board for next time, and just to acknowledge that. So thank you very much.
Take me in the Just say go. Okay. okay. Um, so I am here with a volunteer hat on. So um, as a volunteer, I work with a um, small like thing called Gladden Village. It is a fictional, heritage loving online village. And we have got basically a council, a village council of three. And what we do is we um, do online coffee house events every Wednesday. The um, villagers are mostly people who are housebound for a variety of reasons. And some of them are just heritage loving people. So we've created this online community of people who just love heritage, but we're trying to make people feel connected to the world around them. So basically the ask here is if you or anyone you know can engage non-specialists with half an hour of exciting, passionately told heritage stories, I would love to hear from you. Gladdenvillage.org or you can get me um, on Ruth Allen Baxter on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever. Yay. Yes, thank you. You had, you had 10 seconds there, you could have given us a wee dance or something. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, we've got, uh, uh, yes, please. Come on down. Hello. Uh, my name's Gordon Barr, I'm from the Architectural Heritage Fund. I'm here to give a slight plug for the workshop that my colleague Joe and I are doing in the second workshop session this afternoon. There was a lot of questions coming up earlier after the talk about churches, about how community groups can get engaged with getting hold of these historic buildings and reusing them. And that's exactly what we can help you do at the Architectural Heritage Fund. So if you want to do that, come along to our workshop this afternoon. Our whole remit is trying to find sustainable, trying to help community organisations find sustainable new uses for historic buildings. Um, but we can talk a little bit about funding available to help you do that, advice and other types of support. But the key challenge is it's not about you trying to save the building for the building's sake. It's about you trying to give the building a new use. So the challenge is ask not what you can do for the historic building, mm. but ask what the historic building can be doing better for your community. So come along to our workshop this afternoon. We have some great examples of we've got a reuse of a church, we've got a reuse of a community shop, we've got a reuse of a historic cow shed. Um, you know, what country is a historic building? It's very wide. Come along this afternoon and find out more. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, have we got a hand up online? No hands up on mine, no. There is a hand up. Put a hand up. Unmute yourself, please. Is it a legacy hand? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi, would you like to do a minute? Uh, if you've got one. Right, OK. A <laughs> uh, few minutes and starts right now. Um, so I hadn't expected to say anything, but uh, <laughs> my name is Simon Gall. I'm Public and Community Engagement Officer at the Elphinstone Institute at the University of Aberdeen. Um, we are a, a centre for the study of ethnology, ethnomusicology and folklore. Um, we teach on undergrad courses, we run a master's and we supervise PhD students, etc. Um, but one of our big interests, certainly my big interest, is uh, a kind of field broadly called public folklore in, in the States. Uh, it's increasingly been used here, I think, as a term, and it's a way of working with um, communities around sort of heritage, intangible cultural heritage, if you like, vernacular culture, probably more accurately, accurately everyday culture. And it's largely about helping, uh, or at least a lot of my work is uh, largely about helping groups and organisations and individuals uh, bring their ideas to life, do their work um, uh, better or help sustain their work. Um, and so it's uh, although we do do a little bit of that kind of one way academic kind of stuff where we pr present our ideas and things, but largely it's a, a kind of two way uh, engagement path. Um, I've no idea if that was a minute or not because I haven't set a timer. I can't hear a toot for anything. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Now we had another, there was one, you want to come down here, please. And then I think, is that? Yeah, it would be lunchtime. We have one more and then. And then we will go for lunch. Yeah, it's super fast if we have lunch then. <laughs> you starting? No. Hi all, I'm, my name is Kelly McDonald. I'm a creative technologist, um, which is my fancy way of saying I do storytelling with emerging technologies like generative AI. Really passionate about cultural heritage kind of through and preservation through that innovation lens. Um, can definitely be helpful if any of your organizations are trying or any of you just like you want to know why ChatGPT works the way it does. <laughs> Happy to help. Happy to chat. And to be honest, I just finished my master's. So like if there's income related <laughs> projects in the job, pick me up. <laughs> hey. 
Brilliant. Thank you. I think that's that's us, is it? Yeah, we're going to go for lunch now. And yep. if anybody knows can identify the five clocks here, there are no prizes, but you can feel a warm inner glow. <laughs> and um Yeah, I've just got a quick quick re instruction um for the workshops. So we're just going to um, mute this room, Joanna, so that you can give out the um, Teams workshops. So, yep. OK, so in terms of the in-person workshops, we're going straight into those after lunch. At Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yep. 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 Cool. Um, so I'm just going to be typing some, putting some information into the chat, but I just wanted to verbally share it with you um, as well in case anyone prefers to um, hear instead of reading. Um, what Rosie's saying at the moment is just giving instructions to the room that uh, we're going to be breaking for lunch shortly. And as soon as we return from lunch, we're going to be moving into the first session of the workshops. Uh, the session one workshops, and I will put all of this into the chat, are number one, Historic Environment Scotland's grants program, learn about and explore how community projects can align with funding priorities, delivered by Fraser Gibson, grants team leader with Historic Environment Scotland. Just putting that in the chat now. And number two is, what is the best practice when providing heritage projects for mental health and well-being? Learn how the Amphora guidelines can support this. Delivered by Karen Burnell, Solent University and Paul Everill, Winchester University. So just putting option number two into the chat for you now. And option number three, is Make Your Mark Campaign Inclusive Volunteering Toolkit delivered by Sarah Pierce, who we just heard from Heritage Trust Network. So some of you will have um, already um, put your selections into the online um, survey that was sent out to you. And if you've already done that, thank you very much. We have your selections. If you've not already um, done the selections, you will have been allocated a space in the hybrid workshop, um, which for this first session is the Historic Environment Scotland Grants Programme. If you did not make a selection, but you wish to do so now, please type your selection now into the chat. So for Amphora guidelines, you would type the number two. And for Make Your Mark Toolkit, you would type the number three. For anybody that might have been here at the community conversation that we had last August, it was on an evening and it was all about youth action. And the content of that um, event was created by uh, young people. It was 30 years old and under. And that theme was all about um, youth action and voices ideas, projects, etc. And we had Michael um, as the panel host for that. Um, and so we invited Michael back because for anyone that was there, we were all just quite blown away actually by some of the opinions and points um, and quite frankly charm that Michael <laughs> up So we thought let's get Michael back instead of one of us. Um, so Michael is a student of French and politics at the University of Edinburgh. Returning to the conversations for a second time, outside his studies, he is a consultant working with Sir Lewis Hamilton's foundation, Mission 44, and the End Child Poverty Coalition to ensure their priorities are those of young people. He is also an advocate for equality and human rights and worked with the Scottish Government and partners to create Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights. I'll pass over to Michael. Wow, an introduction like that, and that's got, got a lot of love up, isn't it? So hi, I'm Michael. You've learned all about me, so now we're going to talk about all of our lovely panels. So first of all, we've got Ren Park. Ren joined Glasgow Women's Library in November of 2022 as a volunteer programme assistant. Working alongside Gabrielle Macbeth, the volunteer coordinator, Ren assists in recruiting, training and supporting volunteers in the library and remotely. Ren's really interested in volunteering as an activist endeavour and is passionate about feminist organisations and how they support and uplift people. 
Wren's also recently graduated from their Masters in Applied Gender Studies at the University of Strathclyde. Their academic interests are mainly in queer theory and studies, with a, with a focus on queer anti-simulation, non-binary and transgender identities, and transgender non-fiction. They are also heavily involved in transgender activism across Glasgow, and they are co-founder of Excuse My Beauty, a trans collective organising regular events to funds for trans healthcare. Moving on, we've got, we've got John Pellin. John's the director of the Scottish Council of Archives. John's worked in the culture and heritage sector in Scotland for all, almost 30 years. Prior to joining the council, he was the director of Scottish Civic Trust and previously worked for the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland as the assistant as the director of the communications. We've also got Rufan Baxter from Edinburgh University, certainly from County Fermanagh, and she's a civic engagement manager at the University of Edinburgh um, Heritage Collections and the creator of the Prescribe, of Prescribe Culture, a heritage-based non-clinical service for health, social care and well-being, which is very award-winning. Rufan's passionate and a quite a big advocate for the role that heritage plays in improving mental health and well-being and is determined to increase the evidence base. She's done a lot of projects on this, which there's a lot on here to learn about, so I'm going to skip a bit over it because a bit too much. But in that also, she's the chair of the International Social Prescribing Campus Network and a member of the Personalised Care Interprofessional Education Steering Group. Provide, and she also provides consultancy on developing heritage-based early interventions in social prescribing, both here in the UK and further afield. And finally, we've got Anil Singh Bukal, who is the Deputy CEO of the West Scotland Regional Equality Council. Anil, um, so, the, so he runs two heritage projects there. One, looking at supporting historic environment Scotland with the recruiting processes from a quality, diversity, inclusion perspective. And another, which looks at engaging key stakeholders from within the heritage centre with minority ethnic communities. He's also previously worked for the Central Scotland Regional Equality Council and is a regular contributor to BBC Scotland's Spot of the Day and worked a lot with refugees. So, to kick us off then, I see we've got a panel here, which is all kind of almost leaders in their own little bit of heritage. So, can you all kind of explain your little like, niche interests and how it relates to the broader sector? Uh, yeah, I'll do this. Uh, yeah, so one of two volunteer coordinators at the Glasgow Women's Library. So, we are a feminist grassroots museum, library, and archive, but we also have like a program of events and lots of learning opportunities. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's part of what I'm interested in as well, in that how volunteering fits in our organisation as a form of accessibility, both to our collections, but also to the wider sector, um, and also allows people to kind of get in and learn how heritage sector organisations work and volunteering as a pathway for that. Yeah, so my organisation is um, primarily an advocacy and development body for the Archives and Records Association, but Archives and, and uh, Records Sector, but over the last five years we've done a lot of work on uh, helping community groups with their archival material. So that's helping with digital skills, digitalization, copyright, just um, what to keep what to throw out, how to get their, their archives uh, online. Um, and we've worked with all sorts of groups, not just traditional heritage groups, but organisations that come from heritage and our story Scotland and LGBT Youth Scotland. And we've, we've tried to be as inclusive as possible. Um, prior to that, I was, uh, as mentioned earlier, director of the Scottish Civic Trust. So for, for eight years, I worked with uh, civic societies and community groups around Scotland. So um, over the last 20 years almost, um, I've spent a lot of time getting a better understanding of the of the voluntary sector and the challenges. And I think you know some of the challenges obviously we're, we're going to discuss today and we'll discuss them in the workshop, but it, it, it's clear that there are more people volunteer, volunteering in the heritage sector than there are actually working in it. Um, and I, you know, what I'm keen to do is find ways that we can support them as much as possible. Um, so I am the Civic Engagement Manager with the Heritage Collections at the University of Edinburgh and that's a very new job and the Civic Engagement Service is a very new service and as you can appreciate um, historically the university collections are predominantly used for research, teaching and learning. So my role um, and my, my team mate uh, Laura, our role is to sort of look at how we can take those collections and implement them for a different social impact. So Laura is um, leading on a project that's working with the HMP um, Hormones in Edinburgh and Perth Learning 
centres and um, to sort of support young offenders develop their confidence and skills and so on. And I went down the path of supporting um, people mainly with mental health difficulties, but more broadly and um, social prescriptions. So we sort of managed to kick our service off by being very careful and um, mindful about the target communities that we want to work with on that social impact. And I sort of view it as the the heritage sector are very familiar with the idea of curators looking after particular collections. So Laura and I view ourselves as being sort of curators of particular communities. So we cannot be all things to all people. So we decided very purposefully that there would be a certain type of people we would um, be able to try and create impact with. <coughs> um, and any of you can go on and contribute to that. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And sorry that I can't be there in person today. Hopefully, you can all hear me. Okay. Um, my name is Anil Singh Bhopal, so I work as the Deputy Director for the West of Scotland Regional Equality Council. Um, we're an equalities and human rights charity working to support minority communities across um, the West of Scotland, primarily those from a minority ethnic background. Um, and I run two heritage projects at WESREC, the first of which is called Roots Scotland. Um, which essentially looks to capacity build minority ethnic communities and organisations to engage with the heritage sector. Um, so we run um, conversation cafes to enable um, organisations to find out about funding opportunities and other opportunities on how to engage with heritage across the country. And we also deliver a lot of work from an EDI perspective to support um, heritage stakeholders such as yourselves to learn more about how you can engage with these communities that are normally considered to be hard to reach. Um, we also run an inclusive heritage partnership project which supports Historic Environment Scotland in attempting to meet their um, most, um, well, one of their outcomes from their most recent mainstreaming and equality outcomes report, which commits to attracting, recruiting and developing a diverse board, workforce and volunteer base. So essentially we help them ensure that recruitment campaigns are accessible to minority ethnic communities. We recommend positive action measures to attract, recruit and develop minority ethnic employees at all levels of the organisation. We also, and we also seek to drive staff and management's ability to challenge uh, inappropriate behaviours uh, in the workplace in a positive way as well. Thanks for that, Anil. So I think we can already see here we've got a moving cast of a panel here, but also with people whose priorities and experience is really like what the sector needs going forward. So I guess just some formatting. So given the time, I really want to focus on your questions as the audience. So I'm going to start with some some from Slido, but then for the opportunity to take some from both our audience here, if we want to stand up and ask directly, and indeed from teams in both, I guess, the chat and hands up, whatever we'll figure out as we go along. So as a start question for Rain, in the museums and heritage sector, there can be quite a bit of contention about volunteering versus paid work and opportunities in dealing with exploitation. Do you have any advice for our anonymous ad question about us? Yeah, I'm sure that everyone who was just at my workshop mm -hmm. went on and here they go again. <laughs> um, yeah, I talked about this a lot. Like, um, there's some there's hesitation to volunteering in the sector generally just because we're an underfunded sector and also because of the line between uh, volunteering and um, unpaid labour or exploitation. And um, what I talked about in that workshop just there was the kind of core value that our volunteering programme runs off of is that if the organisation depends on it and would fall apart without it, then it's not a volunteering job, it has to be paid. Um, and that's the thing that we come back to literally all the time uh, and makes the distinction really clear for us. Um, but that also it doesn't mean to say that the volunteering work doesn't have value. Like I spoke a bit in as well about how much richer and better our social media is and our website and our, the research that happens around our collection. Um, because of the work that our volunteers do and that stuff is really crucial like and our, our organisation would be worse without their input and without their knowledge but we don't need it to survive um, and also because of the way our programme works we um, yeah, we don't have a list of roles, we recruit every single person that wants to volunteer with us, we meet individually and we build and tailor a role for them based on the skills they want, either want to learn or want to lend us um, so it's a really like person centred and reciprocal volunteering programme and that's where the resistance to exploitation comes into because it's about it's not what can we get from our volunteers, it's what like what are they kind enough to lend us like. 
accurate for that because I think as well they said in the workshop earlier you know it is a privilege as an organization for you to have a volunteer come with you and I think particularly you know as we've seen you know things like the strategy from HES that just came out of that power to building a well-being economy and the sector's focus on that you know that privilege that you have to get those skills that they actually want also contributes a lot to their well-being in the broader society but going on to another question now to to uh, John and um, there are many competing priorities in a society, in society in these times. How does your organisation balance social needs with heritage needs? Um, well, I don't think the two things are necessarily um, separate. Mm -hmm. uh, um, when you say heritage need, do you mean the the, the needs of the, of of the historic environment is that what you mean? I guess to me, I guess for instance, I think archives are quite a good example of this. So apologies if I didn't have a direct area, but something mm -hmm. like a big copper. So for example, for an archive, there's a lot of professional things that need to happen there to ensure that that collection is there still and preserved. But there's also that social need of that freedom of information. Yeah. So I guess balancing them in order to get people to be able to access it. Well, yeah. as well for the future. Yeah, but no, that's a, that's a, that's a really good point because I think a lot of people think archives are just things that are um, kept away in boxes for the to see, but archives are living documents. You know, mm -hmm. they, they are um, the record of our past. We describe them as the nicely recorded memory of the nation. Um, archives are there to be looked at, they are to be used, they are to be accessed. Um, so I think there's no archivist who doesn't understand that. You know, I think the, the challenge is that archives are really badly underfunded. Yeah. And community archives in particular, you know, are, are really very little funding for that. But it's, I think freedom of information is almost it's 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 a separate thing because like what you're talking about that is recent records. So in in, in Scotland we have um, the um the uh, Public Records Scotland Act, um, which uh, was created in the wake of the Scottish child abuse scandal. So um, all the public bodies are now obliged to keep um, record management plans. So access to records now for people is, is much better than it was say maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. That applies to people going to the care system, in particular people who have really, who've been adopted. I, I, th I think the challenge for us in the sector is um, Really making people recognise that, that archives are not, as I say, just simple records that are there for somebody to access in the future. They're, 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 they're there as important assets for everyone to, to, to enjoy benefit from. Thank you. I think as well, I think that's a very important point, like freedom of information there. I think as we've like opened up a lot of these records to society, there's also new expectations that we have to bring into that as well. Anyway, on to the next step. So I've got a question here, particularly for Neil here. Um, any advice on any advice on authentically engaging with excluded communities, especially New Scots? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, just because New Scots uh, has been mentioned, I'll maybe start off with that specifically. So I used to work for the Scottish Refugee Council up until last year, and they developed a really useful Scotland wide network of community groups working with people seeking refugee protection. It's called New Scots Connect and effectively this network helps to bring groups and organisations together to learn from each other, share expertise and access support as well. Um, so there's a, a really good map which you can access to locate what organisations are working in different geographical areas, but there's also a forum whereby you have 400 key stakeholders, community groups and individuals working to support refugees that can access information that you share on that platform. So I would recommend to any colleagues in the room today looking to engage with New Scots to utilise that um, platform to get messages out to um, the target audience that you're attempting to reach. There's also regional coordinators supporting that network working in each um, local authority across the country and um, their brilliant contacts if you would like to find out more about how to engage with um, those communities. I'll maybe post a link in the chat so people have more access to that information. Um, also on top of that, I, I would recommend really just visiting communities and speaking to them about your work. 
Um, from our own experience, organisations will be more than keen to have input from national stakeholders such as yourselves and a simple act of maybe attending uh, an organisation um, and giving them information about the work that you're doing, engaging with the community, being visible, makes a big difference in terms of encouraging people to engage with your services. Um, there's also a number of integration networks that you can access across the country because we are Glasgow based. Um, I can only really cite examples that are used here, um, such as the Southeast Integration Network, who again can get your messages out to those target audience that, that you're looking to reach. And similar initiatives will apply to um, those working with the LGBT community and people living with disabilities um, and other um, equality groups too. So I hope that helps, but if anything's needed in terms of more discussion after, please feel free to yeah. get in touch with me. Thanks. And just kind of building on that a bit, I'm wondering, Ryan, if you have anything to add, particularly on like, yeah, again, kind of focusing not on excluded communities, those people who don't necessarily get involved in heritage too much. I guess it's sort of like um, the same as what uh, they were saying, is that it's more about like community collaboration. Um, I think for us, a big core part of it is like, are these people in your collections? Like, mm -hmm. are they in your events programs? Like, if, if not, then why? Because uh, I think we found it most successful when people can feel ownership of what the organisation does, or and or ownership of the collections is when they feel that's when that kind of authentic collaboration happens. And um, but we also have like a lot of um, really amazing uh, outreach projects that my colleague Simon runs, and uh, specifically with New Scots um, in Glasgow, um, and that's like. Uh, yeah, like was suggested, like going out into people's communities, sharing your work, and and seeing what what is it that they need for their yeah. for their heritage, and and how do we welcome that into our organisation in a way that's not owning it, but allowing them to own it for themselves. Point. Oh, I'm just curious. Have we got any questions online from teams of that that kind of came through? Just would you be encouraged you can go through spiders? Oh, grand. So yeah, it's all in spiders, and yeah. that's amazing. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, kind of building on that a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out if I'm actually going to send this question to you, but how can we ensure that stories from lower economic areas, industrial areas, urban areas are valued as our heritage? So I guess kind of moving away from more typical definitions of heritage, but more into kind of social and economic heritage area a bit. So um, do you really have any thoughts for that? Would you like to jump in on that one? Um. For me personally, yeah. I think that there shouldn't really be a sort of a tier system mm -hmm. as what is ours and what yeah. because you know we are all one community, it's the one one planet, etc. And we are all interlinked and man is an island. Um, but I think that it's really important and it's difficult, it's very important, but it is difficult to have people from um generally you know classes, sore economic um side of things to for them to believe that their story is as important as valued. So I believe we have a lot of work to do to help them appreciate that their story is as valuable as Sir Walter Scott's story in our collections. Yeah. Um, I always have to start with um, when, when it comes to the university's collections, and, and I'm sure lots of people in the room can um, relate to this, there's a lot of um, quite dead men who started our collections <laughs> and um, they have sirs and lords and earls at the top. Mm -hmm. So I tend to start for the first few weeks without doing any titles or anything mm -hmm. and just keeping almost the story and who's behind the story um, anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, and then by that point they're relating to them because actually things like trauma are not class based. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's we have work to do to make people believe that mm -hmm. their story is valued by us, and that's not an easy thing to do. I don't have the exact answer on this to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I'm just going to expand on that because I think that's a, this whole talk of inclusion and making heritage open to everyone is such an important bit. Particularly as we're talking about resilience, you know, and going forward. So I kind of just want everybody to kind of keep it shortish to like half minute or half. I just want you to give us a kind of basic answer, which is the basic way to the question: Are we doing enough to make heritage inclusive? So I guess. If you can give us your answer and give us like one key action that you think would help, if, if, if you can even give it to one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this this is a question that's been talked about for decades now. I mean, you know, I, I still think the heritage sector, both professional and voluntary, is still not that inclusive. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so you know, why is that? You have to accept that. I think part of the problem is um, to work in the heritage sector, you have to go through generally through university systems, sometimes you have to do postgrad. Um, you tend to come from more economically um, beneficial backgrounds. So, you know, people from working class backgrounds tend not to get those jobs. So mm -hmm. therefore, what they then do is start going into working class areas and doing heritage to people. <laughs> I, think, you know, I think we're all you know, yeah. that, you know, telling people heritage is good for you, but actually their story is, as you say, yeah. it could be ones of trauma, it could be ones of difficulty, it could be ones of which they feel proud of, but they don't have the confidence to talk about them. So I, I think the only way around it is, I mean, we did a little bit of this, we got, we got funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, uh, actually it's a HLS some years ago, to uh, run a scheme where we um, got funding to employ people from different backgrounds, different economic enterprise backgrounds, um, to train up as, as, uh, as um, kind of para archivists. You know, and I think we need more projects like that so that yeah. the sector needs to change, I think, yeah. in order for us to expect people from deprived yeah. communities or people from minority communities. Mm -hmm. But that's but then the whole society needs to change and be yeah. more democratic. Yeah. And, you know, that's 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 kind of a wider societal yeah. problem. Yeah. And then it doesn't have really what kind of someone touch that more. Yeah, I, I mean, I would I would totally agree with what you say, John. And I think what is difficult is we're taking a lot of people who are university educated and putting them out into community and um, museums and heritage sites where actually they don't have the same lived experience as the people living in that community. And that in itself becomes sort of a, a, a bit of a division. Um, and there's, there's, you know, looking at the health side of things, um, there's a, an, an argument that, that students who are from widening Christian patient backgrounds, um, the, the whole sort of, you know, putting back in a fee for medical training, that's been really problematic because really people who are from um, a particular community, if they come and get trained to be a doctor, they're more likely to work in that community. And it's very difficult to have um, a lot of GPs staying in sort of the deep end things. I think it's in a weird way, much less dramatically, um, that sort of thing is happening in the heritage sector. And it's, as you said, it's a lot of um, people being educated and that can cause um, a, a sort of a division that, that doesn't need to be there. It does not need to be talked about. But, you know, the other thing is it's difficult when you're introducing somebody um, and again, I just want to be dropping the titles because you want it yeah. to be a very equal level playing field. So when you're working with um, organisations, it, it doesn't help to go into a room and sort of say, I'm Dr. So and so with a PhD. You don't need to know that today. That's yeah. not appropriate. Yeah, so I think that's a very important point. And then just moving on, I feel like there's kind of a stereotype, I guess, more broadly in volunteering, but I feel like it might particularly be pertinent to the heritage is that kind of post pandemic we've kind of seen a uh, reduction in the engagement from, I guess, your kind of typical sources of volunteers. So I guess that there's kind of this image of like your older person who's retired and wants to fill in a bit. And I, I don't know, there's a kind of reception of somebody from outside the sector that that's kind of um, declined a bit. So I guess what I ask you is, is this true? And how can we go about, I guess, trying to re-engage them? And if not, then kind of adventuring into, I guess, separate sources. So um, we don't talk about for us at GWL, like that's not been true. Um, but I do think it might be true of the wider sector. Like we have more applications coming in to volunteer than we did before the pandemic with a like diverser amount of people. And um, I don't know whether that speaks to like our volunteering program or the nicheness of our collections yeah. as well. Um, but I do think it's like a wider problem. And I think balancing that with like the cost of living crisis and some other things that people have talked about uh, at various points today about who can afford to volunteer. Um, I think a lot of people came out of, uh, it's the balance, a lot of people came out of the pandemic like um, really needing income streams, like really needing to kind of formalise employment opportunities, but also a lot of people came out of it really wanting like community and connection and that's emboldened and sort of strength in volunteering as well. Um, so I, I don't know, I can't speak for about other people's experiences in this. So I guess from a more, I don't know, I thought I see a classic volunteer, no sorry, classic heritage in the panel who'd like to kind of volunteer on that. I was supposed to, I think that might be kind of our heritage first. I don't know. <laughs> is there any, I suppose is there anybody in the room that has a, a yeah. comment or a question on that? Yeah. Oh, I wonder if anyone on the panel thinks that pay 
in the energy sector as an issue. And to give an example of why I think this is seeing a package of jobs, I won't say by whom, advertised in Edinburgh and London for 24,000 with manager in the title. Oh, yeah. And when you look at the, you know how far, how close that is to living wage, real living wages, the only people who might be able to afford those kind of roles are people who have other income sources, whether it's from family or partners. So is it any wonder uh, we are limiting the pool of people? Yeah. So I don't know if anyone in the panel's got any comments on that. And also, yeah, I mean, John was saying about um, leaving a university education, like that's a lot of effort to go through for yeah. a 24 k job like in London. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want really want to do that. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's about those those barriers generally, and I think there's kind of a wider problem on relying on people who work in heritage who do it because they love it, and mm -hmm. there's a there's an element of exploitation to that too. And I think there's maybe a double thing in there because I think some organisations, companies, say, are trying to sort of pull the wool over your eyes by giving you a big fancy title, as in, <laughs> but money's not there. So you know, I think there's an element that they sort of think compensate. Oh, they're more likely to get the next job, but they can say they'd be a manager and. Um, Twenty-four crimes. <laughs> That's the real thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so then, also as well, something else that I've been hearing a lot about is kind of digital heritage. You know, apparently we're all apparently living this new age era where everything's digital. So I guess, what are you? So what are you doing in your kind of projects? To, I don't know, bringing heritage. I guess to more people through digital platforms. So. I guess when can start that, I heard some great things with the GWL. <laughs> yeah, so we have a strong digital, specifically digital volunteering uh, just now. So that's both about developing um, hybrid and remote volunteering for people who can't physically get into the space of this, uh, but also about kind of kickstarting um, digital development of digital skills in our organisations. So we've done lots of podcast recording and lots of digital skills like subtitling, webcast development and um, website development, social media. Um, so yeah, so in terms of like outreach and making our collections accessible, I think our volunteering program got our volunteer cohort have got a lot stronger in using those digital skills to share it recently. But I am I'm not an archivist, so I really, like I can I have no idea what it means yeah. for like digitization in the collection more broadly. But in, in terms of outreach and engagement, I think it's I just think it's really necessary now is how we reach how we reach people. Yeah, so so we've um over the last five or six years, we've been running a lot of courses and events and online events um, for, for community groups, which are mainly voluntary led. My, my colleague, uh, who won't forgive me if I don't mention her name, but um, Audrey Wilson in the audience um, is our uh, partnerships and engagement manager. And one of the projects we've been working is developing your digital skills. So that's been helping people um, just get a better understanding of the, the access to digital skills and what they can do to, to use technology to make their collections uh, more accessible. And we're also uh, just about to launch a new portal called Your Scottish Archives, which is, uh, uh, aggregates uh, archival descriptions from uh, collections all over the country and we're including community archives and that. So we're working with a lot of community groups to get um, their mm -hmm. catalogs online as well. Okay. Uh, I, and I think it's interesting because I mean, when I you know, started in the sector 20 years ago, I'd I, I go, I go to meet a, 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 a voluntary group mainly elderly people, you know, they just yeah. didn't have mobile phones, you know, but, it's, but now, you know, particularly yeah. during the pandemic, I find I was having Zoom meetings with people in their 80s, you know, oh, yeah. I think people have upskilled in technology yeah. a lot, you know, and I sometimes am quite amazed by how much people do, you know. Right, so that was a very valuable contribution, so I'm going to try and now bring it to a close with one final question, so I'm going to ask you all to get me in one word or resilience in the heritage sector is to you. So just one word if possible, maybe a phrase if we're pushing it. So let's we'll start and um, when you get the, get the answer <laughs> first. <laughs> oh, resilience is, um, oh, I honestly don't know. That's a really hard question to answer. One word. Does anyone else want to go first? Yeah. And I think, yeah. <laughs> the question was one word relating to me. One word for resilience in the sector. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. It could be planning, it could be succession planning, it could be anything. That, just one word that kind of epitomizes your like number one on resilience for you. Survival. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to say an empowerment. And the meal. Sorry, I'm going to be a pain and ask you to repeat the question again. I couldn't hear. It's absolutely fine. So one word or what kind of represents, I guess, resilience in the heritage sector to you? Um, 
solidarity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So a yeah, great session. Thank you all for asking so many different questions and getting in. I think some of the hard stuff, you know, thank you the slide on the anonymity we've been able to get some of the more gritty things that we don't always like getting to in the first year. So we can get a round of applause for the great panel. I just want to say um, a big thanks to everybody for taking the time today as we all start to kind of get back into being around each other in person. Um, there's been some really great conversations that have been had today and they don't need to end now. There is some more sandwiches out there. Sorry, everybody on Teams. <laughs> Hope you've got some sandwiches. So, yeah, as I said, if you are on Teams, please feel free to stay in the call. Um, if you want to carry on a conversation um, with Scotland's Churches Trust. Um, and if not, we'd just like to say uh, close and thank you very much, everybody, for coming.